I pledge my eternal gratitude to any law nerd who would edit and combine original Emily's live coverage of this trial with sidebars coverage at specific moments. That sounds like a doctoral project. Here we are in Virginia on trial day 22. All right, in Virginia, here we are, day 22 of the trial. Yesterday was wild. I expect, and this, we're going to see, we're going to see what happens. But I think Amber Heard's team might rest this morning and then get immediately into Depp's team's motion to strike. I wonder if they told Depp's team that they didn't know if Depp would come to the stand as a chess move. Hey, we might still call him. We might not. They truly might have wanted to evaluate their case overnight and see what, if anything, they could get from Depp that would solidify the counterclaim. But I was, my understanding that defense is resting. Is that correct? All right, I'm not going to bring the jury out. Just Girl, she called it. In, so motion to strike. After we finish our motions. She called it. And they come out. I'll let you say. She called it. Yeah, okay. Let's just do it that way. <gasps> Fiery. Right, We're so going to get fire first thing. Based on you have a motion? Motion and to I strike. I did receive your memo ahead of time, so I have reviewed that. I'm so ready for this. Okay. I'm so ready for this. Okay. Get to the mic, Ben Chu. Let's see. Waldman made the three allegedly defamatory statements with actual malice. Right, but clear and convincing is not my motion to strike standard. Under, understood, it's Scintilla. Okay. We, we Scintilla is her motion to strike. Okay. Standard in our brief. Thank you. Scintilla is uh, her motion to strike. Moreover, the court should also strike defendant's claim for immunity and attorney's phase uh, based on Virginia's anti-slap statute. Yeah. She is not entitled to immunity under the statute. Because we know that the court has carefully reviewed our motion papers, I will just hit some of the salient points. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, I would mention, however, uh, Your Honor, that uh, because this is not included in our brief, that there is no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp even saw any of the three statements that Mr. Waldman made prior to being served with the counterclaims in this action which we believe is relevant to many of the legal standards. And as Your Honor is aware, Ms. Hurd had signaled for the past week that she was planning to call Mr. Depp in her case. In she case. has signaled that. And it was our anticipation that she would try to fill what we believe is a gaping hole in with respect to the elements of her proof. Again, there's no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp ever saw any of the three statements about which Ms. Heard is purportedly suing him for $100 million. As Your Honor is aware, the elements of defamation are as Here follows. Here we go. One, the elements. Publica publication of two, an actionable statement with three, the requisite intent. Ms. Heard must establish that Mr. Waldman himself committed all the elements of defamation. I know the court's familiar with this, so I'll try to run through it quickly. C. Parker versus Carillon Clinic, 296 Virginia 319 at 332, a 2008 Citing the case. State well, law to the court. The court knows it. They already have their written memo. For the tort of another person. It necessarily follows that a claimant cannot make out a case for vicarious liability Which is what's against the employer without first proving that the employee committed a tort within the scope of his employment. Was Waldman See also an employee? See Routon Pontiac Corp. versus Alston, 236. Oh, no, I was reporting for IG. 152 at page 156. Which standard Ms. Hurd has not met? Mr. Waldman testified he had a binder of evidence. about 29 witnesses he believed disproved Ms. Hurd's false claims of abuse. Binder. Uh, see the transcript at page uh, 6008 through 6012. And I won't run And he went to the police about perjury. That's fair. But his testimony, as has become quite clear, Your Honor, Mr. Depp uh, is not suing about any of the pub public uh, policy commentary made by the ACLU when it drafted the op ed. And Ms. Hurd put her name argument. to it. What he is suing about here are the three statements 
that were directed at him. He has no issue with women's rights. He supports women's rights. In fact, he that was in the testimony. one, Your Honor, as Your Honor knows, who made that first $100,000 contribution to the ACLU. And Did he made it look? also to the CHL. Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object. Um, Mr. Chu has largely just read his brief and confined his arguments to those directed in the motion. But like we saw with the last motion to strike, <laughs> he's now directing his arguments to something That's other Jessica. than Jessica. She's been running the tech for Team Hurt. She's been great. Making an argument no, not Rebecca. to you, but to the cameras, it threatens, it's disrespectful to the court and never its time. And it also threatens to undermine Rotten the integrity born. of this process and risk the jury being- Were you here yesterday, Rottenborn? The witness that you called, were you here yesterday? Thank you. Thank you. Rottenborn, you huff and puff every time there's an objection, Rottenborn. <sighs> what Mr. Depp is suing about are the three statements. And it's very clear, despite the pious Rebecca, opening Michelle? statement, that about the First Amendment, Michelle. that with the testimony Apologies. of Terrence Doherty and the emails that were admitted as exhibits, that the ACLU and Ms. Heard were conspiring right, Michelle. to make it very clear that those three statements were related to Mr. Depp, because otherwise nobody had any interest in the article. And it, it's crystal clear from that. They wanted Did Rottenborn to explain the court's time to the release court? of Aquaman, Just a which question. Was her first film of what any do you think? significance in terms of uh, popularity. And it's more of I barely touched on agency. The gamesmanship when Ms. Heard plays word games with Mr. Depp about, oh, I didn't punch you, Johnny. I just hit you. Imagine. If the shoe were on the other foot and Mr. Depp, a man, was saying to a woman, oh, woman up, I only hit you. I didn't punch you. At least he said woman And when up. she, it was chilling when she warned him on the tape, you go tell a judge, you go tell a jury that you, a man, were abused. That See if they're going to believe that. Go to the motion to strike, though, Ben Chu. It is an abuse of the system, uh, and she's done it throughout. Finally, Your Honor, and Mr. Rottenborn makes an excellent point with which I agree, which was you know, with is like what? to each of the three statements, Mr. Waldman was clearly identified, even by the tabloid that printed these, well within articles that had both sides represented, that he was Mr. Waldman's attorney. Yep, even attorney. the reader of a tabloid understands that when you're getting statements from attorneys, it's going to be forwarding their client's point of view. Mr. Waldman is not the only attorney who has spoken out. Uh, Robbie Kaplan, who was um, Ms. Hurd's second attorney. So Ms. Hurd started out <laughs> with Eric George. He made comments to the press. Objection, saying, Your Honor. Again, this is so much further beyond what Your Honor is addressing. I, I'm, finishing I up, Your Honor. Okay, I'm, finishing. I'm finishing up, Your Honor. Okay. I'm finishing, finishing up. Ron my, Warren's my not point, wrong. Your Honor, but it's on point shouldn't is interrupt. that Mr. George made wrong. statements supporting Ms. Hurd's position. Ms. Kaplan made very clear statements uh, supporting I could see the judge's position case. on the merits, and so did Mr. Waldman. But everybody knows when reading those that those are statements bipartisan. So for the reasons that we've stated and the reasons set forth in the brief, we respectfully sub, uh, submit that the court should grant a motion to strike or um, in light of the fact that Mr. Depp may reappear, at the very least, take, take it under these submission. motions under advisement until the close of all evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, That's sir. That's fair. All right. In this matter, I've reviewed all the defendant's evidence as to her out. counterclaim, and I've considered the arguments of her counsel and plaintiff's counsel. Uh, first, to address a few issues that I believe are outside the motion to strike, and that's as to the slap defense. The slap defense is just that it's a defense, so it's really not considered in a motion to strike. Correct. Um, having said that, we... I, we went down that legal road on Friday as far as the slap defense goes, as far as the jury instructions. In this particular case, if the plaintiff prevails, it must be with actual malice. Therefore, if it's with actual malice, immunity does not apply under that statute. So um, oh. we will deal with that with jury instructions, and we have. Oh. Um, as to independent uh, contractor, uh, again, I think it's outside the motion to strike. However, Mr. Waldman was plaintiff's attorney since 2016. Before the initiation of litigation, there is evidence that Mr. Waldman had a certain role during the prior divorce proceedings in the UK case. Additionally, there is evidence that shows his legal representation was broader than just a limited litigation, uh, as outlined in all the cases presenting an attorney as an independent contractor. 
So the only evidence in this case to this point is that Mr. Waldman was an agent to Mr. Depp, and that is the basis uh, to weigh the motion right. to strike. So they're <clears> going to deny it. As far as the opinions argument, again, um, I think that is outside the motion to strike. The opinions argument, the court has already ruled on this matter as to the three statements that are issued in the counterclaim. She has multiple times. Uh, ruled uh, that they were not opinion at the demur and at summary judgment. It looks like this um, is going to so go to the jury. Argument. So what we have going on here is um, – this is right at the end, or the first sidebar of the day is right at the end of um, the plaintiff's um, motion to strike the um, counterclaim. So Mr. Chu was arguing, and then um, Mr. Rottenborn was also arguing, and then this is right here at the end of Judge A's ruling on the counterclaim. So um, she says, it is not my role to measure the veracity or weight of the evidence, the force record in the Virginia Supreme Court have made it crystal clear that actual malice is a question for the fact finder, so therefore the plaintiff's motion to strike is denied, okay? Mr. Chu, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Rottenborn, thank you, Your Honor. The court, thank you. Is there any other preliminary matter before the jury? Ms. Bredoff, yes, Your Honor. May we approach? The court, okay. Signed, bars roasting on an open fire. The court, all right, Ms. Bredoff. Your Honor, two days ago on Sunday, May 22nd, more than two months after the close of discovery and four days after trial, plaintiffs supplemented their witness interrogatory that had asked for the identity of anyone who had knowledge of any of the claims or defenses in this case, among other topics. And there was a court order that was entered on August 10th, 2020, ordering them to, pro to provide those. Plaintiff included the following people for the first time. Morgan Knight, Jenna Price, Lydia Fuller, Miroslava Chavez, Kate Moss, David Kolber, and Morgan Tremaine. Plaintiff then added several of these individuals to their list of people they are calling today and tomorrow, specifically David Kolber, Morgan Knight, Kate Moss, Morgan Knight, again, apparently, um, and Lydia Fuller. Defendant is severely prejudiced by these last-minute additions, many of whom we have no idea who they are. Our client doesn't know who they are, many of them. We have no opportunity to conduct any discovery, no opportunity to conduct any depositions, and your honor may recall that we have moved to compel on our other witness interrogatory that states, quote, Please state what their knowledge is, identify the knowledge, end quote. The plaintiff objected to it on the basis of, quote, why bother? We're at the end of discovery, end quote, and then your honor denied it. Well, if they had to, at the least, a minimum, respond to that, then even on Sunday, they would have had to tell us what those people's knowledge is, but we're way too late. Your honor has not even allowed us to have pictures in that were produced after March 1st. I, 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 can, already, I can already say what's going to happen here is that there's a difference because this is rebuttal, Elaine. And now they have all these other people. Now, with respect to David Colbert as well, he was Mr. Depp's apparently treating physician in L.A., in Los Angeles, for his finger. And he, we had a specific interrogatory, Your Honor, the court, uh-huh. <laughs> Ms. Broadoff continues, so you have all the interrogatories, a set of it. So we have compiled all of their interrogatory responses for the supplemental. But if Your Honor would go to the fourth tab, to the second page, and this was responded to by the plaintiff, in January of 2022, and it says, quote, identify each mental health or physical health care provider that you saw or consultant who examined you or provided treatment or services to you from January 1st, 2010 to the present. State the reason and duration, end quote. And you'll note, and this is their response, Dr. Colbert is not identified. In addition to this, Your Honor, one of the people, Mr. Rottenborn, nor did they ever produce medical records. Ms. Bradoff, right, right. <laughs> Mr. Rottenborn, nor did they ever produce medical records for Dr. Colbert in response to at least four document requests that we could cite for your honor. Ms. Broft, thank you, yes, and I do have those requests. First request, number 43, quote, all documents pertaining to the three surgeries to reconstruct a finger, and the second request, number six, quote, all medical records from physical and mental health care providers, end quote. Number seven, quote, all correspondence or records received or sent from health care providers, end quote. And number nine, all documents, communications concerning the alleged injury to your finger, end quote. Then on top of that, Your Honor, we found on social media last night, we didn't even know who this person was, Morgan Knight, the court, are we still talking about Dr. Kolber? <laughs> Ms. Brown, no, this one's another one of the ones that Mr. Ruttenborn moved on. The court, I haven't ruled on that one yet, but okay. <laughs> Ms. Brown, actually, I'm hoping you will rule on all of these, Your Honor, because none of them were identified. The court, well, you agree, or see, here we go. You agree rebuttal witnesses can come in that haven't been identified, Ms. Bredoff. Your Honor, only, only if there's a reason for not having identified them. In response to interrogatory, the court, right, 
if something came up in trial, Ms. Bradoff. But we had a clear interrogatory that said any defenses were claimed. The court for Dr. Culver, Ms. Bradoff, well, any of them. The court, well, you don't know what's going to come up in the trial testimony, so rebuttals, you can't. Ms. Bradoff, your honor. <laughs> She could say, it's patently unfair, <laughs> the court. It's the same, I think you gave it to me, Miss Broft. Sorry, I gave it to you. The significance of this one, Your Honor, is that this is a tweet by Morgan Knight, one of the people they've identified to testify. And it's clear that he's been watching the trial. He has a picture of Donnie, Johnny Depp testifying. Then he says in his tweet that, Mr. Rottenborn, that umbrella guy. Miss Broft, yeah, it's that umbrella guy. And then Morgan Knight is commenting from that umbrella guy, quote, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy, end quote. So he's responded to this tweet that has what Mr. Depp is testifying to in this trial. So he's clearly violated the witness rule in any event. So in response to your honor, we would be severely prejudiced by these individuals. Kate Moss was somebody that Mr. Depp dated. The court, I know. We can't do these all in one time at one point. Miss Broft, oh, I'm sorry. She already said that, Elaine. The court. Kate Moss, though, that's a your bottle. I know Miss Hurd said something about Kate Moss. Mr. Chu, yeah, what she said. Miss Broadoft, what Miss Hurd said was she thought about Kate Moss when she saw Mr. Depp, the court, right? Miss Broadoft was about to push Whitney down. <laughs> Mr. Chu, it referred to the false allegation. The court, that's a rebuttal evidence. Mr. Chu, yes, the court, it would be rebuttal evidence. Miss Broadoft, what would be the rebuttal, Mr. Chu? The rebuttal would be that Johnny didn't push her down the steps. That was the clear inference. She was trying because no other woman has ever accused Johnny, the court, so Kate Moss is a different issue. Miss Broadoff, but Miss Hurd didn't testify that he did. She just said, quote, that's what came to my mind, end quote. <laughs> Mr. Chu, yes, she did. The court, excuse me? Mr. Chu, sorry, Your Honor. The court, okay, I wrote it down because I didn't know what was going on because she said she was on the stairs and she says, quote, all of a sudden I heard Kate. I thought of Kate Moss on the stairs, end quote. That gave a negative connotation even to me. I'm like, oh, does that mean something happened with Kate Moss on the stairs? And I have no idea. So I thought that the jury might have thought that. They're entitled to that rebuttal. So next person. <laughs> Miss Broadoff, well, just if I may, Your Honor, just to make my record, they would have known that knowledge before. The court. She didn't know Miss Hurd was going to testify did it, to it, did she? Miss Broadoff, she testified to that in the UK, Your Honor. Mr. Chu, good luck. She changes their story every five minutes. Well said, Mr. Chu. Miss Ruttenborn, I think to the extent that the prior discovery request said, quote, all people with knowledge, end quote, they've been on notice since the UK about them. The court. Rebuttal witnesses, I'm going to allow rebuttal witness if there's a nexus to it, but as far as, that's why they need to be separate. Dr. Colbert, if you have an issue where they didn't provide him as in discovery as a medical person, is brought off, right, let's take the first thing. So now she wants to go one at a time. The court, can you respond to that one? Ms. Vasquez, may I address Dr. Colbert? The court, okay. Yes, okay. Ms. Myers, Your Honor, first of all, Dr. Colbert, so we identified documents in response to this interrogatory. Dr. Colbert's name and contact inform information is reflected in those, Ms. Vasquez, and medical records. Ms. Myers, communications. There are medical records. There's communications between Dr. Colbert and I apologize between Dr. Colbert and simultaneous speech between unknown speakers, it says. Ms. Myers, Dr. Kipper and Mr. Depp's nurse, Debbie Lloyd, and the only, we are bringing Dr. Colbert for a very limited rebuttal purpose. The court, what's the rebuttal purpose? Ms. Myers, so both Ms. Hurd and Whitney testified that Mr. Depp on the stairs incident was wearing a hard cast that was able to hit them. Dr. Colbert is just going to testify that his hand was in a soft cast and he had a pin in it. He's just going to testify to the state of his hand on that specific, at that specific time period. The court, okay. And you're saying these Bates numbers, because I can't tell, uh, correspond to his medical records. Ms. Myers, I believe they are, Your Honor. I cannot, I cannot say for certain, but I know there are documents that we would have identified in response to this that do reflect Dr. Colbert being Mr. Depp's hand surgeon in LA. The court, do you have that, Ms. Myers, after the Australia incident? The court, all right, do you have that anywhere in here as far as identifying Dr. Colbert? Ms. Myers, I believe our supplemental responses identified the documents themselves, but we can confirm that he is reflected in those, Ms. Broadoff. Still wouldn't have identified, <laughs> Mr. Rottenborn. Your Honor, if I may, I don't believe his name is in any interrogatory response. And also under 8.01399, to the extent they didn't produce medical records that we've seen. There's a few emails back and forth with Dr. Kipper, but to the extent that they want to have him testify as to treatment or diagnosis, they'll have to produce, here's a copy for you all, they have to produce, those things have to be contemporaneously documented under Virginia law or else he can't testify to those things. We've never gotten, other than a handful of emails, I don't believe we've gotten any medical records. So if he's going to testify it was a soft cast or whatever that, the court, you would have to have had that as medical records. Well, 
they're saying these bat bait stamps are those medical records, but I don't know if they are those medical records, and I think he could testify, Mr. Rottenborn. If they want to represent to the court, then, Ms. Myers, I know that there are communications between Dr. Kipper. I cannot represent that they, the court, if there are no re medical records, he can't testify, Ms. Vasquez. We need to check, Ms. Myers. We need to check the court. Okay, agreed, Mr. Chu. We need to check. Sounds like they need to check. What do you guys think? The court. I'm assuming he's not your first witness, so he only testifies if you have turned over those medical records. Not emails, not, but medical records to the defense, Mr. Rottenborn. And even if they have, also he's not identified in interrogatory so that we've seen. So if they, the court write, he's identified in medical records. Mr. Rottenborn, yeah, but they say, if you say, quote, identify all your treatment providers, end quote, and they say they don't put any names, they just list a Bates range, I don't think that's identifying him specifically, the court. Did you identify him as a treatment provider? Well, you can look at that too, Mr. Rottenborn. So those were in two designations. Ms. Bredhoff, no, and your honor has the, the court. Okay, well, if he's been identified as a treatment provider and the medical records were turned over, he can testify. If he hasn't, then he can't testify. Leave it at that. Mr. Bredhoff, thank you, your honor, the court. All right, now let's go on to Morgan somebody, I assume. Ms. Bredhoff, Knight, Morgan Knight is the next one. The court, Morgan Knight. Ms. Bredhoff, now this person apparently, based on the tweet, was somebody who either owns or is a manager at Hicksville. Well, Hicksville's been in this case all along. We've always argued that he trashed the trailer, the court, right? Ms. Burdoff, and then on top of it, we have this, the court. Well, you're, or you're going to give it to me a third time, that's okay. So Mr. Wyatt, I don't know why it says Mr. Wyatt. That must be a typo and that she said Mr. Knight. So I think that's, that's gotta be what it is. So Mr. Knight is a rebuttal witness for what? Ms. Vasquez, he will testify that the trailer was not damaged to the degree that was the court, that the trailer was not. Ms. Vasquez, yes, in response to both Ms. Enriquez, Whitney Enriquez, and Ms. Hurd, that both claimed the trailer was trashed, he will testify that's incorrect. He will also testify that, I mean, I understand I have to make a proffer, but this seems, the court, no, that's fine. Ms. Vasquez, now the date, Your Honor, first of all, I don't even know if this is Mr. Knight's tweet, Twitter account. Ms. Brodoff, it's the Umbrella Guy's Twitter account, and he's saying this, and then Morgan Higby Knight is responding to him right down there. Ms. Vasquez, that's April 21st, Your Honor. Ms. Bradoff, right, which is in the middle of trial, Ms. Vasquez, okay, he's a rebuttal witness, meaning he stepped forward after this time, he stepped forward in May, Your Honor. Ms. Bradoff, that doesn't make any difference, they still have the witness, Mr. Rottenborn. But the rationale for witnesses or potential witnesses is not watching the trial, sorry, but the rationale for witnesses or potential witnesses not watching the trial doesn't change if someone is a rebuttal witness or not. And we would ask, Ms. Vasquez, they weren't identified, Mr. Rottenborn, that any witnesses that allow, that Your Honor allows to testify be voir dire before they testify. The court, well... Here's the issue with this one because it's televised. I mean, there's an issue. If you don't even know your witness yet, how can you be, Mr. Rottenborn? I understand that, but it's still manifestly unfair, taking Elaine's uh, phrase there. The same rationale for prejudice applies whether someone is a rebuttal witness or known. It's particularly someone like these people on an issue that's been, Hicksville, that's been an issue since the first day of this lawsuit. So to the extent that they thought they and they've known about the allegations of the trailer being trashed since day one of this lawsuit. So to the extent, Ms. Brodoff, Christy Sexton testified too, and she was deposed two years ago. Mr. Rottenborn, if they thought we might need to call Morgan Knight to testify to this, they should They should have known, they've known this. This isn't something that came up anew. The court, you just said that he came forward in May. Ms. Vasquez, he came forward in May. And since then, I've asked him to please, Mr. Rottenborn, your honor, Ms. Vasquez, not be, Mr. Rottenborn. The fact that the trial is televised shouldn't create prejudice to our, to our side, Your Honor. I mean, the fact that the trial is televised shouldn't create prejudice to this side just because the witness has watched the court. No, I understand that. But the judge weighs on the rule of the witness and on how it has affected the witness. If you have a rebuttal witness who didn't know they were a witness, I can't bind them to the rule on witnesses at the beginning of the trial if they don't know. I would have to bind the whole world. <laughs> So I understand he came forward in May. If you want to voir dire him outside the presence of the jury on that issue of how much he's seen and how much his prejudice is for the rule of witnesses is discretionary. And I can do that, Mr. Rottenborn. Well, I, and I would ask that they not speak to him before he gets on the stand. The court. Well, she told him since May, Ms. Vasquez, I don't remember the exact date. It's very recent, Your Honor. Court, not to watch the trial. Ms. Vasquez, yes, I did. And as soon as we identified him as a potential witness, I did instruct him, per Your Honor's ruling, to please do not watch any of the trial, do not watch any of... The testimony. He was contacted by somebody else that worked at the court. Okay, this was April 21st. Like I said, I have to weigh it. Mr. Rottenborn Hicksville has already come into the trial by April 21st, so he has the benefit, unlike any other witness, he has the benefit of knowing what the testimony is on Hicksville. Mr. Chu, he could cross-examine him on that. Mr. Rottenborn and the court. This says, quote, Johnny Depp will be accused, end quote. He would have had to have, Mr. Chu, he can cross-examine him. The court, he said, 
Simultaneous speech between unknown speakers, it says. Miss Bardock, if I may, Your Honor. Christy Sefton was deposed two years ago, and she testified to the trailer park. We also got a court order with the judge. The court. I'm still talking about Mr. Knight. Oh, God. Miss Bardock, right. The court. We can just do this one at a time. Miss Bardock, right. No, no. And she testified to the trailer being trashed. This was... They would have had the knowledge, and we had a court order that ordered them to produce any documents relating to the damage to the trailer, so that they should have and would have reached out to him at that time, the court. He came forward on his own, and so I'm going to, again, I'm just going to weigh that, okay? We're going to see what happens with, you know, that. I can't bind him on the rule on witnesses if he wasn't a witness at the time. I can voir dire him outside the presence of the jury and see what he has seen on this trial, and I can weigh it from there, Miss Broft. And, Your Honor, also, since this was on April 21st, over a month ago, and... We just got him identified two days ago. I would want your honor to voir dire him when he first came forward. When he first, She just said she was going to voir dire him. When he first communicated the court, both of you can ask questions. That's fine. Miss Broff, right. But if they waited until two days before, you know, they're putting on a rebuttal witness, putting on their rebuttal witnesses, and they knew for a month. Then I think that's manifestly unfair. There we go. Another manifestly unfair. Second one. This sidebar. They have a duty to timely supplement their witness interrogatory, and if they became aware of them, they needed to timely supplement. We're severely prejudiced by this. We have no opportunity to examine him, to take a deposition, Mr. Rottenborn. We can't talk. The court, these are rebuttal witnesses. Then you wouldn't have any opportunity to examine them. That's what rebuttal witnesses are, Mr. Rottenborn. But if they were on notice that the, he may be a rebuttal witness a month ago and sandbagged us in supplementing their discovery responses, we could have sought a deposition of him. We could have asked the court, the court, you know how trials go. I know you didn't have Mr. Rottenborn, but Hicksville's been at issue more than two days, Your Honor. And, Miss Broft, it's two years. <laughs> Miss Vasquez, Your Honor, I spoke to him for the first time yesterday, last night. After court was the first time I spoke to him. The court. Rebuttal is a different beast, and I know you know that, Mr. Rottenborn. Mr. Rottenborn, I understand that, but Miss Vasquez just said she was. I thought you said you instructed him a month ago and stepped forward. Miss Vasquez, I have not had an opportunity to speak with him. The court. He came forward in May. Mr. Rottenborn, I understand. But she just told the court that he was instructed not to watch the trial a month ago. And that's the court. I've made my ruling. He's, he's going to be able to testify. If I find that, he's a rebuttal witness. And we'll talk to them about the rule of witnesses and see where we're at. I don't know. Okay, Mr. Chu. Thank you, Your Honor. The court. All right. Next one. Miss Broadoff. Next one's Jenna Price. We have no idea who that person is. Miss Vasquez. She's not testifying, Your Honor. The court. She's not te testifying. Next one. Miss Broadoff. Okay. Lydia Phillip. Miss Vasquez. She's not testifying. The court. These are my favorite ones. <laughs> Miss Broadoff. All right, we've talked about Kate Moss. We've talked about David Colbert, Morgan Tremaine, Miss Vasquez. He's testifying. Miss Bradhoff, I have no idea who that is. Miss Vasquez, he worked for TMZ, and he will testify that TMZ did receive the video from Miss Heard. Also, was directed to be there on May 27, 2016, to take certain pictures of her face where she would be. I mean, the court. This is rebuttal evidence. Miss Vasquez, that's rebuttal. The court. Okay, next. Miss Bradhoff, again, Your Honor, they still would have known that information and should have identified it in an interrogatory response. The court, during trial, things happen. Those are rebuttal witnesses. Next one, the objections overruled. Miss Broadhoft, that's the last one, Your Honor, but I would, the court, okay. I got a big one about Miss Vasquez, Dr. David Colbert, Your Honor. The court, what about this new Neumeister witness? Miss Vasquez, I confirmed the x-rays are the court. I've got this three times in my folder. Male speaker, what is this? Miss Broadhoft, oh, oh, he's going to argue that the fourth, Miss Vasquez, we're not ready to argue that. Miss Broadhoft, okay. The court, we'll do that tomorrow. Miss Broadhoft, so the next one is Jennifer Howell, Your Honor. Jennifer Howell is by deposition designation. And Your Honor, I have the pages that we're actually showing. None of these are on legitimate rebuttal testimony. And Your Honor may recall excluding our Bergovici because he wasn't on rebuttal. So let me just go through these. So first of all, the testimony of Amber does not rebut or contradict Amber's testimony or anything in this case. They designated Howell... 23130 through 20, in which Miss Howell testifies that she met Amber Heard at the Pineapple Express Fair in 2008. Neither Amber nor Whitney were asked when Amber met Jennifer Howell. It's not a legitimate rebuttal. The next one, the court, I'm sure it's just not meeting Jennifer Howell. That's the rebuttal. Well, what's the, I mean, I don't know, Miss Broadoft. It's not a rebuttal when she met Amber Howell. Amber Heard, getting Amber's name wrong again. Uh, does she mean Laura Amber Howell? <clears throat> Amber Heard, because Amber Heard never testified whether she met Miss Howell or not. She was never even asked about Miss Howell. The next one is they designated 255 20 through 9. Miss Howell states that she never showed that Amber never showed her photographs or told her that Depp was abusive to her. Amber never testified that she confided in Miss Howell, showed Miss Howell photographs, or told her that Depp was abusive to her, so it's not rebuttal. Oh my god. The third one, plaintiff designated Howell 
299-30-11, in which Ms. Howell testified that she received an anonymous donation of $230,000, and she believed the anonymous donor was Elon Musk. Defendant was designated at 345-12 through 22, in which Ms. Howell testifies she received a check from Fidelity Charitable with a note saying he was in honor of Amber Heard. This is consistent with Amber's testimony that she donated $250,000 with him, but it was not going to count to any overall pledge. This donation is unrelated and outside the $6.8 million, and it's not rebuttal testimony. The next one, Your Honor, please bear with me. They have testimony. They've designated testimony regarding Whitney. That doesn't rebut as well. The first of those is 12, 5 through 14, and the other one that's virtually the same is 229, 1 through 4 through 14, which states that Jennifer Howell is the CEO of the Art of Elysium. Whitney testified, trial day 19, transcript 247.21 to 248.1, quote, she's the founder of the Art of Elysium nonprofit, right? End quote. Quote, she is, end quote. So that doesn't rebut. Then they designated Howell at 2960 through 3013, which states that Whitney lived with Ms. Howell from May 2014, uh, 15, to April 2016. Whitney testified, and this is again day 19, transcript 248.5 through 9, and these are all questions they asked in cross-examination. Quote, around May 2015, you actually moved in with Miss Howell, right? End quote. And then she says, quote, May 2014, end quote. They say, quote, yes, end quote. The court. I'm not going to go through the whole deposition, so you're saying it's not a rebuttal witness. What's this person, Miss Vasquez? She is a rebuttal witness to both Whitney and Miss Heard as to the stairs incident and her, Miss Enriquez's, what we will call perjurous testimony that Miss Heard was actually abusive towards Mr. Depp. That Miss Heard was abusive toward Mr. Depp. Ms. Bredoft, there's no testimony that's designated that comes in on that. There's nothing. There's nothing in the designation, Ms. Vasquez. There is an email that Your Honor sustained the objection, and Ms. Howell testifies as to why she sent the email to Ms. Enriquez, and she explains that, and Your Honor did allow that testimony. So, but we believe that that is, Ms. Bredoft, it has no context. It says she sent an email to the court. I'm going to allow this. Mr. Chu, thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Vasquez, thank you, Your Honor. The court, next one. Ms. Vasquez, Dr. Culver's x-rays that were just shown to the hand surgeon, Dr. Moore, yesterday came from Dr. Culver. Those were medical records. Those were the x-rays from Dr. Culver. Mr. Rottenborn, okay, a couple points, Your Honor. Those were attached to the Australian medical, re medical records. Number two, so Dr. Culver's in LA. Number two, there's nothing. They still didn't identify him in the interrogatory responses. The court, did you identify him? Ms. Vasquez, I need to confirm that, Your Honor, but Mr. Rottenborn, they didn't. And I mean, you can do it, Ms. Brock, and I have. The court, they're going to confirm Mr. Rottenborn, all right, okay, and then the other thing I would say is even if the x-rays are attached, even if, like, let's say those did come, the court, so they didn't identify it in the designations. Ms. Bredoff, they've not, Your Honor, Mr. Rottenborn, right, but one more point. If you look at the statute, even if the x-rays were laid were Dr. Colbert's medical records, he really does not want this Dr. Colbert to testify. If those are the only one, only records he produced, if what they're going to do is get him to get up there and say it was a hard cast, the x-rays don't show that. And if you see the first sentence of the subsection B, quote, if the physical condition of the patient is an issue in a civil action, the diagnoses, signs and symptoms, observations, evaluation histories, or team plan the practitioner obtained or formulated as contemporaneously documented, end quote. So the medical record, whatever they're going to have him testify about has to be in medical records that were produced. So if it's just x-rays, that's not related to the court. We'll see when they come out. Ms. Vasquez, and your honor, I have to be fair, I have to read it, but I would submit that he's actually a fact witness and not testifying as a medical expert. He, the court, you still have to produce the medical records. I would have to agree with that argument, okay? Mr. Rottenborn, this is fact witness. Mr. Chu will check, your honor, thanks. The court, any other ones? Mr. Rottenborn, could we just, it would be helpful if they could confirm by like the morning break or something because otherwise we have to prepare that. The court, we'll see. Mr. Rottenborn, okay. The court, I'll let them. Mr. Rottenborn, all right, thank you, Ms. Bradoff. So for the two that are going to, your honor is allowing in, the court, three actually, Ms. Bredoft, they do get to the court. There's the video deposition of Ms. Moss and Mr. Knight we're going to have to talk about. Ms. Bredoft, and we'll get to voir dire all of the, all three of these when they, the court, no, not all three, Mr. Knight, the others are done. Male speaker, that's good. <laughs> Female speaker, we'll get all of them. The court, one's a deposition. Ms. Bredoft, oh, no, oh, not how, I wasn't talking about how I was talking about the court, no. We're not voir diring her. The only one that will be voir dired is Mr. Knight, Ms. Bredoft. Not Morgan Tremaine, since they didn't identify him till Sunday and Mr. Miss Heard testified the court. No, the only one vaudeering is Mr. Knight to see where we are. Okay, Miss Vasquez, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Chu, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Rottenborn, thank you, Your Honor. The court, okay. Back to open court. The court, all right. Are we ready for the jury then? We're all right. Are we ready yes. for the jury then? Your Honor. Okay. <laughs> I guess the jury's coming in. 
Whereupon the jury entered the courtroom. You guys, if you haven't hit the subscribe, <laughs> now's my last chance to ask you to do it. And the jury's coming in. We Are we going to hit 500K before the jury comes in? It's possible. Does all sided case law have to be Virginia case law? That's, oh my God. That's a little bit more in-depth question because it has to do with splitting jurisdictions and they can cite, but it's not binding. But federal court in that circuit can be more binding. So yes and no. Um, most persuasive is local. Is local. You guys, we banged. Can we just celebrate real quick? The jury's coming in. We're going to bang. We banged. It's 500K and we fucking banged. I don't know what to do, you Good guys. Morning, ladies and gentlemen, thank I you. apologize. We have a few housekeeping matters to take care of, but thank you. You have your seat. Judge A. Are your next witness. Thank Your you Honor, for giving us the time. Defendant and counterclaimant Amber Heard, we rest. All right, thank so you. So they've formally Are rested evidence? in yes. front of the jury. Uh, thank you. Your next witness. Thank, thank fucking God that somebody said well, highest grossing call, DC uh, Dr. Colbert next, but I know we have a preliminary matter that we need to deal with briefly. If we may approach. Sure. Um, Ms. Myers says, Your Honor, we call Dr. Culver next, but I know we have a preliminary matter that we need to deal with briefly. If we may approach, the court says, sure, so that they can have a sidebar. Ms. Myers, so Your Honor, we, uh, we sorry, Your Honor, we went back and confirmed Culver's notes were produced at DEP 18263 through 99. Mr. Rottenborn, notes or records? Those are emails. Ms. Myers, no, 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 those are, these are his notes. I can show you. I have it on my phone. Mr. Rottenborn, we asked them to send those to us, the court, sure. Ms. Myers, there are records from Cedar, Ms. Vasca, Cedar Sinai. He works for Cedar Sinai. Ms. Myers, he works for Cedar Sinai, and it says at the top, Dr. Colbert. Ms. Vasca's in Los Angeles. Mr. Rottenborn, I'm not sure that any of us have seen these before, Your Honor. We just asked them to we just asked them to email them to us. Ms. Vasca's they're bait stamped. The court, well, you can email them to him, and as soon as we take the morning recess, you can take a look at them. Ms. Broadoft, they still haven't identified them in the response, Your Honor. Ms. Myers, well, in Your Honor, in our supplemental response, we referred defendants to the medical records in this action, which contains the responsive information in one of those documents, DEP 1892, as is identified here, and that identifies Dr. Colbert, the court, but you never identified him in your submission. Mr. Rottenborn, Your Honor, it's not hard to list names. <laughs> Ms. Vasquez, none of the names are identified. Ms. Myers, yeah, we listed the base numbers that can, included the information, the court, so none of their names. Ms. Vasquez, none of the medical providers have been identified by name, the court, so none of the medical providers were put in there by name. Is that correct? Mr. Rottenborn, I can't speak to that, Your Honor. All I can speak to the court, so you didn't object to any, yeah, I mean, that's where she was getting at, because obviously, so you didn't object to any of the other medical providers, Mr. Rottenborn, I don't know, I don't know, I didn't, Ms. Broff. Well, they didn't have any other medical providers testify here. The court, well, they, again, Ms. Myers, Dr. Kipper. Ms. Bredhoff, no, no, they didn't identify Dr. Kipper, Your Honor. <laughs> they identified him in the witness interrogatories. We had an opportunity to dispose him. Dispose him, sorry, depose him. <laughs> the court, well, as a witness, but I'm talking about that your objection is over the medical records and that they didn't identify him as a medical provider. Mr. Rottenborn, Your Honor, I can't speak to the other, a lot of the other doctors have come in numerous numerous ways they've been on the radar screen for years <laughs> here there's miss burdock we didn't identify them <laughs> mr rottenborn it's not hard to have an interrogatory response that lists a person by name <laughs> to just bury it and say quote you better review this and maybe you'll get a name from it end quote that's total sandbagging it's gamesmanship it's not appropriate and especially to do it with one day's notice when especially under 801 under 399 your honor we would need to see the records to see what the court well i'm going to give you the records rule 801 i think is covered if these are the medical records. That's covered. Female speaker. Yeah, the court. The question now is just if he was identified as a medical provider. Mr. Rottenborn, that's the paragraph, and it doesn't, Ms. Bardoff. It was January. That was supplemented. January 2022. We already had Kipper. We already had Blostein. We already had everybody else, the court. But they don't identify those people here either. Ms. Bardoff, well, but they identified them in their witness interrogatory, so we had them anyway, Mr. Rottenborn. They hadn't given us those names. This is totally different, Miss Broft. Anyway, I mean, we're not, yeah, we're not playing games, Your Honor. I mean, if they had identified them already as witness interrogatories, then we already knew that. But we didn't know about Culver, and we didn't know that they were anticipating making him a rebuttal witness. Miss Myers, Your Honor, I would just point out that the document that identifies Culver is DEP 1892. That's a document that would have been produced very early on in the, the court. So these aren't the ones that identify him? Miss Myers, no. We identify the Bates range, DEP 1628 through 1927, and within that is DEP 1892, which identifies Dr. Colbert. It's other medical record from Dr. Colbert. Mr. Rottenborn, 
I have no idea what that is, Your Honor, but it's not hard to put a name. <laughs> third time. Third time saying that. This is just, it's preposterous! I added that word. <laughs> um, female Speaker, Your Honor, they did not object to Miss Broadhoft. If they'd put the name, we would have known that they were contemplating calling him, Mr. Rutmore. We didn't know that there was a name. <laughs> the court. Whereas the, quote, plaintiff refers defendants to the medical records produced in this action that the plaintiff offered, end quote, Miss Vasquez, quote, from which, end quote, the court, quote, from which information responsive to this interrogatory may be obtained, specifically indiscernible, end quote. Would have liked to have known what that word was. Mr. Rottenborn, it's not hard to, oh my God, really, it's not hard to list the name of the doctor fourth time. The court, I know, Mr. Rottenborn, it was coming up for the first time. The court, it appears they complied with it, the response. Miss Vasquez, they didn't object, Your Honor. Mr. Rottenborn, they didn't. We asked them to identify, well, you don't object to what you don't know. Miss Vasquez, from which part? Miss Myers, are you saying you didn't have these documents that we identified? Mr. Rottenborn, I'm going to keep my comments confined to the court, but they didn't identify the doctor. We have under 399, 399s only con covered if what he's going to testify to is in those medical records, and I need to see those. The court, all right, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to allow him to testify if it's in those actual medical records within those medical records, okay? Mr. Rottenborn, we would ask those be, are those, can your honor ask them if they're trial exhibits? Because again, and and if they're not here, say, <laughs> the court, this is a rebuttal witness, Mr. Rottenborn. All right, are they here? Based on your honor's rule, ruling about medical records, and if they're here, say, he can't testify to what they say. <laughs> Female speaker, he's testifying about his treatment. The court, he's testifying from his memory, I assume. This is just a discovery issue, and that's what I'm trying to address right now. None of these medical records are coming into evidence, Mr. Rottenborn. Understood, but we need to see them. The court, right, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Miss Myers, I'm sending them to you right now, the court. So send them and we'll look at them and see if that does, because it seems like he's limited to what he's going to testify to is the type of cast it was. So Mr. Rottenborn, can your honor ask them to confirm that? Miss Myers, well, we're going to ask about the state of his hand, but also the cast. Mr. Rottenborn, well, that's way different. The court, well, you need to, Miss Myers, that's rebuttal. The court, I know it's rebuttal, but now because it's medical records, I need to know exactly what you provided. Miss Myers, there's a list of notes that cover, it seems like, the full range of his treatment, and I just sent them to them. Miss Broadhoff, but he cannot testify to that under the rule? The court, what was the rebuttal part, Miss Myers? The rebuttal part is the state of Mr. Depp's hand in March 2015 when he supposed, when Miss Heard, Miss Heard and Miss Enriquez both testified that Mr. Depp was able to attack them and try to push them down the stairs at the stairs incident in March 2015 doctor and that he was wearing a hard cast at the time. Dr. Kolber is just going to testify that his finger was in a pin. There was a skin graft and he had a soft cast on at the time that he had recently performed surgery. Essentially, yes, that was what his, what that was what this hand state was at the time. Miss Bredoft, that's expert testimony. The court, just that he performed surgery and he had a soft cast on, not a hard cast. Miss Vasquez, and a pin in it. Miss Myers, and a pin in it and a skin graft. Mr. Rottenborn, if there's going to be any testimony on what the cause of the finger injury was, because that would be an expert opinion. Miss Myers, I'm going to ask if he has an understanding, but the court, no, you're not. <laughs> Miss Myers, okay, I will not. The court, not going to ask that. Mr. Rottenborn, I've asked the question twice, and they've now identified two more things that they want to go beyond the court's rulings. Can we get a complete? The court, I understand that the only thing they can talk about is the pin. They did the surgery, the pin, and the soft cast. That's, uh, now I'm thinking in my mind, I'm like, but what about skin graft? That's all I should hear, Miss Vasquez, and the skin graft, Your Honor. Skin graft on the pin. Miss Myers, that was on the surgery. Mr. Rottenborn, that's new. <sighs> Miss Vasquez, no, it's not new. It's like their children, like siblings, like um, quabbling, quar wait, what? Squabbling, quarreling? Okay, right. I think I combined the two <laughs> to get, what did I call it? Squab quabbling? I don't even remember what I just said. Oh my God. So squabble, quarreling and squ squ squabbling. I can't. Squabble, <laughs> quarreling, squabbling. Okay, children quarreling slash squabbling, whatever it is. All right, um, that's new. Miss Vasquez, no, it's not new. Miss Myers, no, it's not new. It was reflected in Debbie Lloyd's notes as well. The court, please just address me, Miss Myers. I apologize. So this is just there was a surgery performed, and then the state of his hand on the date of the alleged incident. So what the state of his hand was after the surgery after that surgery. And so that involves essentially what he did in the surgery and what, how the hand was after that, the court. We're not going to go into the whole surgery, Ms. Myers. I'm not. I'm just going to say there was a surgery performed and then what was the state? You know, that what the court, what exactly is he going to testify to this? Ms. Myers, essentially he's going to say, quote, I put a pin in it. <laughs> there was a skin graft or a cadaver. 
So that can't possibly be correct. A cadaver over the top of the finger. Okay. There was a skin graft or a cadaver. Oh, I guess that kind of makes sense, right? I guess if it's like, maybe that's another term. I don't know. Medical people, help me out here. Is that correct or is it another typo? Cadaver. I don't know. There's a skin graft or cadaver. I mean, a, a splint maybe is what I would be thinking. Over the top of the finger and then it was wrapped in a soft cast and immobilized. Essentially, the court, and that's it, Miss Myers, yes. The court, all right, well, we'll see if it's in the, Mr. Rotten, where I'm going to be ready to jump up and the court, and I'll jump up there with you, okay? Because that's what we're going to work with, <laughs> Mr. Rottenborn. If we can have a chance to, the court, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and take our morning recess to give you a chance to, to look at that, Miss Braddock. And just as long as we're up here, Your Honor, to save some time later, they have listed Dr. Curry as a rebuttal witness. I don't think she has anything that she can rebut. Wow. So I just, the court, well, I mean, Miss Vasquez, Dr. Hughes's testimony, Your Honor. She can rebut Dr. Hughes's. I can't even b believe she's having to say that. The court, if they can rebut Dr. Hughes's testimony, that's their rebuttal. I mean, obviously, Miss Braddock, she will have to be designated in order to do that. The court, no, she was an expert witness. How would she not have anything to rebut? So, no, the answer is no. Miss Vasquez, thank you, Your Honor. Back to the court. I mean, wow. This is a very long sidebar, the, um, though it feels right, like a splitting and hairs distinction. It's apologize not. again. We have a few things to take care of. We're just going to go ahead and take our morning recess oh, now. Oh, shit. 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not talk to anybody, okay? That's a whatever. Do not do any outside research. Sorry. It was the same thing. Whatever the issue is, is an issue. That's, that. that's, a, what? Um... Right. If the doctor testifies, then is that WebEx? Yes. Okay, so I'll get that set up too while we take the break as well. All right, All right. we'll go ahead and take a break. Let's make it 10.50 to give them time to look at everything, okay? All right. They're having an issue, it sounds like, with disclosures. Let's take a break to let them look at everything. So All right. I'm hearing Judge A. Okay, so they have a morning break here from 10.34 to 10.53. So... 19 minutes, 19 minutes, yep. The bailiff, all rise, please be seated and come to order. The court, all right, yes, sir. Mr. Rottenborn, can I approach? The court, okay, approach. Miss Myers, here comes another sidebar. Mr. Rottenborn, I'm still skeptical that the medical records discuss what they're going to want, but I'll just take it question by question and I'll object if I think it goes beyond what, Miss Myers, and your honor, may I just say I thought, as you said, that the medical records were a discovery issue. I mean, we can call him to rebut testimony that is based off his memory of treating Mr. Depp, but it wouldn't necessarily be reflected in the medical records. Mr. Rottenborn, no, not under 399. The court, you testified, not testified, <laughs> Ms. Myers, I represented that the topics that he would be testifying to, yes. The court, that's what it is, Ms. Myers, right. And I don't think it's a proper objection that the soft cast is not in the medical records or something like that. If he, we've produced his medical records and he's testifying as of the court, it comes in, you can cross-examine. Mr. Rottenborn, right, but the only thing that he can testify to is something, or as 399 says, observations, diag diagnoses, etc., etc. The court, he's not going to give any opinions, Mr. Rottenborn, correct, and anything he testifies to has to have been contemporaneously documented in the medical records under the statute. The court, well, you have to be provided, Mr. Rottenborn, all right, but as, but as contemporaneously documented. So if he didn't document something in the medical records, he can't get up here now and say, quote, oh, and I also remember this and this and this and this, and that's not reflected in the medical records, end quote. The court, but you're saying the cast is in the medical records, or sorry, is in the records. Mr. Rottenborn, I'm saying there's a reference to a splint, but I'm going to, and I can cross-examine him on it. The court, you can cross-examine him on that, Mr. Rottenborn. Understood. If they want him to say there's a soft cast, oh, I see, he's kind of saying the difference between the word splint and soft cast. I think that's what he's saying. If they want him to say there's a soft cast, I'm not going to object to that, probably. I mean, depending on what the question is. But if it's beyond, if if it's something that, based on a quick review of the medical records, is not in the medical records, he can't testify to any observations or diagnoses or treatments that aren't in there, Ms. Vasquez. The soft cast. Ms. Myers, Your Honor, I don't think that a medical professional is limited in their testimony or what they decided to document in the medical records. They have the medical records that were taken contemporaneously with the treatment, and we, you know, some of what he testifies to may be reflected in those medical records, and some of them may be from his own recollection of treating Mr. Depp. The court, it just talks about, quote, shall be disclosed, end quote. Didn't talk about testifying. 
Mr. Rottenborn, but it says if the, I'm trying to do my best here, if it's the court communications between physicians and patients, and I understand that, except at the request or the consent of the patient, Mr. Rottenborn, right, but the first, the court, then the practitioner will still need to come in and testify. That's the testify part. The part you're talking about just says that they shall be disclosed, Mr. Rottenborn, right, but it says, quote, as contemporaneously documented, end quote, that's the operative. The court, right. But that doesn't affect his testimony, though. Mr. Rottenborn understood. But if he's testifying to diagnoses that aren't in the medical records, he can't do that under the statute. I mean, I'm sitting here wondering, well, what does the statute say in regards to if it's a rebuttal witness? Because circumstances for discovery are different, right, apparently. So um, the court, he can do that. He can do that because he's that's not testimony. Testimony is up here on A. B is just talking about what needs to be turned over. This is not talking about testimony, actually, okay? Okay, well, I guess that kind of... It's kind of what I was talking about. Mr. Rottenborn, okay, the court, but I mean, you can cross-examine on that clearly, okay? Mr. Rottenborn, okay, thank you, Ms. Myers. Thanks, Mr. Chu. Thank you, Your Honor. Back to open court. It's really hard to plan for what happens during jury deliberation week because I don't want to be, like, going to get a massage and then having the jury come back. Like, fucking hell, that would suck. So, do you swear from tell the truth under penalty of law? Get it, Judge yes. Your Honor, I would just object that Dr. Culver appears to have a sack of documents right in front of him. All right. So you can put your hand down and any documents you have, if you could put them away and just testify from your memory. Okay, It's sir? just a post-it note, rotten born. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Just right. a post-it. Good, question. Good morning, Dr. Culver. Good morning. Could you please state your full name for the record? David Allen Culver. And what is your profession? Surgery. I'm a plastic and hand surgeon. And how long have you been a plastic and hand surgeon? At Cedar Sinai, I'm guessing. Been in practice for 26 years. When did Mr. Depp become your patient? Sometime in March of 2015. What was the state of Mr. Depp's hand immediately after that surgery? It, it was injured and um, he had soft tissue loss and a fracture of his distal phalanx. And what type of cast was on Mr. Depp's hand after you performed that surgery? It was a plaster splint. Welcome back, Mr. Marks. Moving the TV. Um, you've testified in this case previously, but would you just um, briefly remind the jury who you are? I'm uh, Richard Marks, and the uh, I'm a uh, full-time entertainment transactional attorney. I make deals uh, every day for productions and for individuals. I'm in the trenches negotiating and then making sure the contracts reflect the deals. Um, and I'm very much distinguished from uh, the other side's expert who is not an attorney, who's not in the trenches making deals, is not in that day-to-day -day process. I'm better. And are you familiar with the testimony of um, Catherine Arnold in this matter? Yes. Have you been asked to analyze that testimony and provide opinions in response? Yes. And generally, what are those opinions? Look well, how my, easy my this, opinions look how are easy that, this questioning um, is. Just... Uh, she's very uh, uh, slick and smooth, uh, but she's she seems not lovely, an but she's wrong in deal making. Uh, her assessment of damages is built on nothing, and it's wildly speculative. Are you? Well, we all said that yesterday, opinion, Richard Marks, and we're not experts. It's customary for an actor to renegotiate the fee for a subsequent picture option in a multi-picture contract when a film is successful. Yes, I heard that opinion. And are you also familiar with her testimony that under those circumstances, an actor will renegotiate a 50 to 100% increase in their salary for the next optional film? Yes, I heard her say that. Do you agree with those opinions? Absolutely not. Why not, sir? Why not? Well, w what we're dealing with in this case is a test option agreement. And that's an, uh, an agreement uh, it's a multi-picture agreement, and it's the nightmare for people like me. You, The test is going to take place, let's say, for 10 actors the next morning at 9, and you have to fully negotiate a contract that might cover four movies and have it signed before they're allowed to test. 
so that if they're chosen for the part, we have the full contract. There's no renegotiation. So you've got a contract for a multi-picture deal. It's usually a franchise uh, and uh, you negotiate the first movie. And normally if they get the part, they're the chosen one, uh, they're the stars born moment, if you will, uh, they get the part. Normally their salary is um, uh, inflated from their normal salary because now they're going to play a character that could go on for four movies. In this case, uh, Ms. Hurd's first salary when she got the part was $450,000. Hmm. If Warner Brothers and DC Comics decided to make a next movie, um, they could recast her. They had no obligation. All they had was an option. But if they did cast her up front that they had uh, agreed to more than double her salary, like two and a quarter times to get to the million dollars. Uh, these are large uh, bumps, if you will. They're, if an actor is on a series, say, they go and they have five options. They go up in increments of 5%, 10%, 20%, not these multiples that you see in uh, uh, a test option agreement. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they aren't renegotiated normally. They are in some instances, but not normally. What's the significance of the test part in a test option agreement? That's interesting. Uh, the, the test significance is that He's just easier an established to to. actor usually wouldn't test. They'd be offered the role. The, uh, Ms. Heard was in a group of actors that re needed to be tested to see if the studio wanted to hire them. And then if they hired them, uh, they would be locked up for potentially four movies at very lucrative uh, increases because out, after this. Aquaman uh, one, she gets to a million dollars. Aquaman two, she oh, yeah, gets this to two million like the Holly, dollars. OG Hollywood deal maker. I'm just four, fascinated by him. Uh, three, excuse me. You get to four million dollars. OG Hollywood deal These maker. These are unheard of bumps if you're going on a normal career and trying to increase your salary by increments. They're What's letting the him talk and talk and talk because her team does not have the time to cross-examine him. So let's see what he says. Well, the argument, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, time is an issue. Ms. Here. Arnold says that Ms. Heard lost all these opportunities because of they, that, that those losses were caused by uh, uh, Adam Waldman's statements 16 months later. So I think the timing. Sure. Oh, that's Needlehop objecting. Oh, they're approaching. Dashing through the court <laughs> on a sidebar open sleigh. Mr. Needlehop, do you honor me? We approach the court. Sure. Sidebar, Mr. Needlehoft, I don't believe I've seen anywhere in the designation that he would comment on what the Waldman statements have to do with their renegotiation. Court, okay. Ms. Lick Rose, I mean, I don't think he is responding to Ms. Arnold, and I'm going to discuss this with him, Mr. Needlehoft. And it's in the rebuttal report, the court, that's in the rebuttal report, so you can't go into the Waldman statements because it's not in the rebuttal report. <laughs> Ms. Lick Rose, okay, I think, I, I think it's just, that's must certainly that should say, I think it's just, just looking at that. I think it's just talking about the timing, the period of time after the Waldman statements and the impact on her analysis. Mr. Neuhoff, you can't go into that court. So I'll sustain the objection. Ms. Lake Rose. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Back to open court. Um, so let's just talk about what's happening. Depp's team has 15 hours and like 51 minutes. Heard's team had like four hours and nine minutes. They are letting him talk and talk and talk because they're not going to be able to cross-examine him on all of it. They simply do not have time. But he is methodically picking apart what the expert said. 16 months is a huge period of time to say if she had a Star is Born moment, why weren't the deals flooding in? Why weren't the movies flooding in? And they're allowed to keep relating back to all the testimony they heard in court heard in court. Mr. It's not hearsay. Your overall it's assessment prior of testimony. Ms. opinions in this case. Did they suck? Uh, my overall <laughs> assessment of her opinions is that they're not worth the paper they're not written on. She knows something about our business 
but not about negotiating deals. She may have uh, gotten someone at the more at the Endeavor office to uh, breach confidentiality, but so she never laid out no, no, the, the building blocks. Objection, objection, yeah. objection. objection. You have to stop talking, Mr. Marks. Thank you. Um, beyond the scope. It's not beyond the scope. Yeah, Mr. Marks, can you just limit your um, limit your testimony to your opinion about um, okay. Ms. Arnold's opinions, please? My opinion, as someone who's made deals uh, as a deal maker for almost 50 years, is that uh, she calls herself an expert, but she's not. She uh, doesn't have the background. She doesn't have the day-to-day -day, uh, knowledge. And her testimony that I heard did not back up her bottom line. If you want to get those figures, you have to show why uh, they're deserved. And again, uh, it, it, she was constructing a Jenga without the bottom uh, pieces. She was constructing it, it Jenga It does with not no hold up under scrutiny by someone who makes deals. It doesn't hold water. Um, this is now the full battle of the experts, and it's going to be expert Thunderdome. All right, your next witness. Star-Lord. <laughs> I think Played the jury is Michael Spindler. probably Michael well aware. Spindler? You've testified previously, correct, Mr. Spindler? All right, just a reminder that you're still, still under oath. Okay, sir? Yes. Right, they are moving you. quick. I like that Mr. Marks is just staying in the room. Um, Spindler. <laughs> yes, sir. They're moving fast. Good morning, Mr. Spindler. Good morning. Uh, can you remind the jury who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm Michael Spindler. I'm a forensic accountant. I'm a CPA, a certified fraud examiner, amongst some other certifications. My kid's interested I'm, in being uh, a forensic accountant. With uh, B. After Riley this case. Advisory Services, a national firm that does forensic accounting, bankruptcy and restructuring work, and business uh, valuations and appraisals. I've got over 40 years of experience. Are you familiar with the testimony rendered by Ms. Arnold in this matter? Yes, I am. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold testified that Ms. Hurd has suffered economic damages resulting from three statements made, made by Mr. Wald? Yes, I do. Do you have an opinion of that claim? I do. What is it? All right. Sidebar time. Dun, dun, dun. Sidebar time. What is that? Is that Sesame Street? That's not Christmas themed. Oh dear. Okay, well, we'll, we'll correct it on the next one. The court. Yes, sir. Mr. Rottenborn, this is the court. This transcript is in. Mr. Rottenborn, this is Mr. Spindler's deposition transcript taken on. This is volume 2, March 25th. The court. All right. Mr. Rottenborn, I asked him these questions and he testified as follows. The court. All right. Quote, are you offering anything? You are not offering any opinion that would impact the alleged defamation by Mr. Depp of Ms. Hurd's career, end quote. All right. So it's not in his designation either. Is that correct, Mr. Dennison? I'm reading it. So thank you, Your Honor. The court, okay, sorry, we'll share. Mr. Rottenborn, and I have copies. He's essentially saying, quote, I'm just addressing what Ms. Arnold said, not running my, rendering my own opinion on what the impact of the alleged defamation is, end quote. And so Mr. Dennison's questions just now was essentially that said, quote, have you developed an opinion on, end quote, Mr. Dennison, I'm asking him about Miss Arnold. The court, yeah, he was asking about Miss Arnold's opinion. Mr. Dennison, he wasn't going to testify about his opinion. The court, okay, if you want to rephrase the question, as to Miss Arnold, Mr. Dennison, yeah. The court, okay, thank you. You may continue. Back to open court. Something, oh, we're done. We're done with that sidebar. I was hoping to get to one more question. Could Team Johnny Depp still call Stephen Crowley as a witness? Are we Amber Heard perjury in her own drug use? I don't know if they uh, will. It's thanks, not Mr. on their Schiller. list. Now, you indicated that you would listen to Ms. Arnold, and she testified on behalf of uh, Ms. This Heard is again going to damages to for the counterclaim. Have you formed an opinion as to the testimony and opinion rendered by Ms. Ar by Ms. Arnold? Yes, I have. And what's what that is opinion? It is not adequately supported, and it is unreasonable. Boom. There were multiple elements to that analysis. Um, both damages that related to her film career and to endorsements. Have you analyzed both those issues? Yes, I have. What is your opinion of the claims that have been asserted relative to the film career and endorsements? Okay, well, 
First of all, with respect to her damages calculation, there was no calculation per se. Um, she initially looked at these comparable actors and seemed to use that as a basis for numbers. She didn't provide the underlying calculation. She didn't provide underlying support. Uh, and then it appeared as though uh, in her testimony, she backed away a little bit from that, but she still suffers from the issues of not providing detailed calculations or support for where those numbers come from. Which was different than his and testimony. she still, to some That's extent, fair. appears to be using some kind of comparable analysis. What methodology did you understand Ms. Arnold to adopt at trial? Okay, well, it looked like somewhat of a mix and match approach. She used different approaches, I believe, for different <laughs> elements of the damages. Although it's, huh. it's still a little bit unclear to me, a little bit vague, but uh, there are four basic components that she was looking at, uh, and uh, we can go through those in, in any order you wish. It's now, interesting that they're coming in with like, this is what you saw to yesterday. The television series, series portion of her analysis. Dennison, ask him to go through the four elements. What do you understand uh, that methodology to be? Okay. I wanted the elements. Jackson, Your Honor, may we approach? All right. I wanted the four elements. Oh. I'm dreaming of a short cipher Just like the ones I used to know All right, will it be short or not? Let us find out. Sidebar, Mr. Rottenborn, there's nothing in his report talking about how he, she's going to address different methodologies other than he just says they're unsupported that Arnold's calculations are unsupported. Going through television versus movies, he's not an expert in that, and he's not an expert in causation. He's a forensic accountant, and there's nothing in his report on that. Mr. Dennison wants to point out something. Mr. Dennison, he's going to talk about her historical earnings and the fact that the notion that you can't just simply attribute a million dollars to every movie theater, movie role she gets, or I'm sorry, television series episode where she gets when her history is $200,000. It's directly within the, the court well. It goes to entertainment value, which Mr. Marks has already testified to. Mr. Jennison, right. But this is rebuttal testimony where she testified she was going to get a million dollars. The court, right, I know, but I'm saying Mr. Marks went through that. This expert is not qualified to talk about the entertainment, Mr. Jennison. But he's going to talk about the $200,000, the court, in relating to movies. Mr. Jennison, in related to television series, the court, all right, I'm going to sustain the, obje the objection. Mr. Rottenborn, thank you. Mr. Jennison, just so I understand what the issue is, because I want to be candid with you, I don't want, I intend, the court... It's not in his designation, and it's not. And he's not an expert in the entertainment field. Mr. Dennison, I'm not going to ask him about entertainment issues. I'm going, simply going to ask him what she made. The court, what's the relevance of that? Mr. Dennison, because he uses historical earnings as his basis. The court, he can't, he's not going to. <laughs> Mr. Dennison, he's just charted his historical earnings, which had multiple components, Mr. Rottenborn, which he just testified to the overall assorted earnings. He doesn't go anywhere into the components and what causes that he doesn't explain those. Mr. Dennison, no, but she made a lengthy testimony as to what level of, what elements of earnings were provided, and so each of those elements build into these historical earnings. And we indicated in this rebuttal testimony, and he's going to rebut the testimony provided by the witness, Mr. Rottenborn. I gave him an opportunity in his deposition to be read Catherine Arnold's testimony. I said, quote, what do you have to say about it, end quote. After reading the transcript, he essentially said, quote, well, she doesn't identify specific things, end quote. He's already testified to that. We have no problem with that. I mean, he does say she doesn't identify specific opportunities, but to go through and talk about, quote, this is what she would have made from TV, end quote, that's the entertainment part that does not come in. Mr. Dennison, yeah, but he's not going to say, quote, this is what she would have made in TV, end quote. Um, Mr. Rottenborn, well, I don't know what he's going to say. Mr. Dennison, you think he's going to say with respect to TV? Court, this is what she made? Mr. Dennison, this is what she made. Mr. Rottenborn, that's not in his this report. He just got Ms. Hurd's tax returns. That's all he's got these numbers from. There's no evidence in this report that he's Mr. Dennison. The witness can testify. The court, if he's not analyzing it in part of movies or TV, Mr. Dennison, right. The court, he's not going to analyze what she would have made or future earnings. Mr. Dennison, no, nothing like that. He's going to say historical earnings are best, I'm sure that's supposed to say best predictor or prediction, best predictor of future earnings. That's what he said throughout. The court, all right, I'll allow that. Mr. Rottenborn, that's fair. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Dennison. Yeah. And... Back to other courts. Did you analyze what historical earning um, Ms. Hurd 
had during the period that you were concerned with relative to television shows? Well, yes, during 2019, she entered into a contract in July of 2019 to uh, appear in Thank a television you, series at $200,000 per episode. All right. You can do it. What about endorsement deals? Did you look at what she had made on endorsement deals during that period? Uh, she did have a contract with L'Oreal uh, at $1,625,000. Hello again, Mr. Spindler. That always annoys us the most. I'm going to ask you a few questions that may There's refer seven to minutes. statements in Go. Amber's counterclaim against Mr. Depp. Um, when I refer to those statements, I'm going to refer to them as the Depp Waldman statements. Do you agree that we can both be on the same page what I'm referring to when I say that? Uh, that's fine. You can I'm use your terminology. I'm sorry. There's an injection, sir. Hold on. Can we approach? Okay. Sidebar. Mr. Dempson, we did this yesterday as well with a witness with this Depp Waldman statement label. There's no direct evidence in this case, and you just heard the argument. These are Mr. Waldman's statements. The court, I understand that's your theory of the case, but the jury instructions are not, they, they, to be, they need to be Mr. Waldman's analysis, right? Not just Mr. Rottenborn. I'm just using it so I don't have to say, quote, do you understand that these statements that are the basis for Ms. Hurd's counterclaim, end quote, it's just the terminology, Mr. Dem Mr. Dennison. He knows what Mr. Waldman's statements are. He's doing that to drive home for the jury that somehow Waldman's statements are Depp's statements. The court, it's his theory. Mr. Dennison, yeah, I know. The court, I know, Mr. Dennison. I understand. <laughs> Back to open court. Camille is a shining beacon of the legal profession. I hope she inspires many more like her. Her cross was amazing. So, Mr. And it's Spindler, nice to see a young attorney the have their you star is born moment. The in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim against Mr. Depp, correct? I'll understand that, yes. You're not offering any expert opinion on what impact the Depp Waldman statements by Mr. Depp has had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Other than taking a look at Ms. Uh, Arnold's uh, calculations. calculations. And you're not offering any expert opinion about what impact, if any, social media coverage of this case or of Ms. Hurd may have had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Okay. You're correct. That's other experts. Can we approach no further questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dennison, can we approach your honor? Mr. Rottenborn, no further questions. Thank you. The court, all right, approach for a sidebar. Mr. Dennison, we'll be doing the court. Okay, changed your mind. All right. Thank you, though, Jamie. Back to open court. I mean, they just narrowed down what his testimony was for, but I don't know why they needed to. He was like, can we approach? No, no further questions. Great. We're back to redirect. Turn the mics back on. Right. Thank you, Mr. Finley. You can have a seat in the courtroom. No redirect. Free to go. Thank you. All right. No redirect. That was right, fair. Next witness. Waldman, you got to be, not Waldman. Um, Plaintiff calls Doug Banya, Your Honor. Dennison, you got to be faster on those He's objections. Last name for me. B A N I A. Ooh, back to social media Q scores and things. So I wanted to look at the Waldman statements, look at the dates uh, that they happened, and then analyze those as it compared to the Twitter data that I had. Have you prepared a demonstrative that reflects that aspect of your analysis? Yes. Yeah, it was a big own goal introducing yeah. hashtag Amber Turd to this jury. I can't imagine it. Have yourselves a merry little sidebar. The court, okay. Any objection to the demonstrative? Mr. Needlehoff, what's this? Ms. LaGrosse is a summary. He provided a very long chart that does the breakdown of all the tweets by month starting in January 2018. And so this is just a summary of that. Rather than going through it all month by month, it's derived from the same data. Mr. Nienhoff, then I guess I don't object. I can't know that for sure, but it's just going to be used as a demonstrative. Ms. Lickrose, yeah. The court, just a demonstrative, 1293. It's a demonstrative. Mr. Nienhoff, that's fine. Yeah. Ms. Lickrose, thank you, Your Honor. The court, do you have it? Ms. Lickrose, I'm sorry, we have it. We're going to put it on the screen. Back to the court. Uh, Mr. Vine, can that was you explain choice. to the jury what this demonstrative shows? Yes, please. Yes. Um, so this shows um, the total hashtags and tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell was analyzing. Which chat was your uh, this criticism is the summary of Schnell data that, that he didn't uh, have a process that are for this? From January 2018 uh, to June of 2021. And again, uh, these are related to the four, four hashtags that I discussed. Um, 
Whenever I get an assignment such as this, when I'm dealing with a, a defamatory <gasps> statement that's allegedly gone viral online, I'm relate it more uh, to the UK case than the involved, Walmart statements. There's a lot of data involved. That's what's I like to take the data and I like to do a, a 30,000 foot view of the data to see what I'm looking at, to see Talk if there's anything the interesting, odd, different about the data. And, and the first thing that I noticed is 35% of the tweets were prior to the Waldman statements. Yep. So again, remember my assignment is to determine if the Waldman statements are part of the, the, the tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell analyzed. So obviously if uh, these tweets were prior to the Waldman statements, yep, this in no way the UK they trial. have anything to do with the Waldman statements. So th that was the first uh, issue um, that I noticed. Then I noticed uh, what I like to call kind of the alleged defamatory time frame. And as I discussed, that's when the um, uh, Waldman statements were published. That's the date down here. You know, the first one was in the beginning of April and, and the last one, which is the third one, was at the end of, of June. But what I found interesting is only 2% of all of the tweets happened during Yikes. this Waldman statement period. So really, these are just observations. And for me, there were red flags that I made note of. And then I just continued with my How analysis. How many red flags did you see? Uh, based on your expertise, what are your overall opinions about Mr. Schnell's testimony and the Twitter hashtag data? You know, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence that any of the tweets uh, were related uh, to the Waldman statements. Um, Mr. Schnell, there's no correlation there. Uh, he also provided no evidence that there's any causation that, you know, uh, the, the Waldman statements call, caused any economic harm towards Ms. Heard. Your Honor, I'm about to switch to a different topic. It's now time for lunch. Now or push. All right, it's going to be a, push. a little while, I assume. A, a little bit more, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead and break for lunch, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research. And okay. Lunch. Just let's go ahead and share the screen. Is it already prepared? Nope. <laughs> we are professionals here. That's the WAP we talk about on this channel. We are professionals here. Sometimes, sometimes we're ready. Sometimes we're just, we're one of those streamers. Okay, so this is just after the lunch break. They have an hour and three minutes this time to snarf down their sandwich. Um, yesterday, in terms of trial days, day 21, they had 59 minutes to snarf down their sandwich. So they got four extra minutes. The bailiff all rise. Please be seated and come to order. The court all right. Would you like to have your witness take the stand? Thank you, sir. All right. Are we ready for the jury? Miss Bradoff, a couple of things. The court, okay, sure. Sidebar, the court, yes. Miss Bradoff, your honor, the attorneys for TMZ have told us they have filed a motion with this court shortly ago. Oh, that's right. I remember this. The court, okay. Miss Bradoff, and want to have the opportunity to argue the motion to quash the testimony of, I think his name is Tremaine Morgan. <laughs> Is she sure that it's not um, Tremaine, Laura, Amber, Morgan, Heard? <laughs> Ms. Vasquez, Morgan, Tremaine. The court, what's their basis to do that, Ms. Bredoff? To protect their sources. So she just want, they asked us to tell the court that they had filed it and that we would like the opportunity to argue it. The court, not going to happen, okay? Wait, Ms. Bredoff, okay. We also, with respect to the other one, Morgan Knight. Is that his name? The court, yeah, Ms. Bredoff. That, that, uh... <laughs> Ms. Bredoff, the one that's testifying, I did want them to just represent what he's testifying to, the court. They said the trailer, the Hicksville trailer. Ms. Vasquez, correct. Ms. Bredoff, anything else? Ms. Vasquez, yes, he was there, present, he observed, the court. But this is all Hicksville related, correct? Ms. Vasquez, yes, yes. Ms. Bredoff, but he was there. Ms. Vasquez, he was there, present. He observed Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard interacting with friends, the court. But it's all to do with Hicksville. Ms. Vasquez, it's all rebuttal related to Hicksville, court. Okay. Ms. Bredoff, all right, we're going to do the voir dire, Mr. Rottenborn. The one other thing we wanted, we just wanted to get a sense. Sorry, Mr. Chu, sorry. Ms. Bradoff, it's the gummy bears. Oh my God, what? Y'all. Wow. Wow. It's the gummy bears. What the heck? I can't wait to put this with the video and see if we can see what's happening there. 
Mr. Rottenborn, I just wanted to get a sense of who else they plan to call today because I don't think, I don't know how long they are planning on going with Mr. Banya, but I don't think the court, is Mr. Knight the next one? Ms. Vasquez, yes, the court. So after you finish here, we'll have to excuse the jury so that we can have a voir dire of Mr. Knight. Ms. Vasquez, okay, that's fine. Then we have two other depositions that we'd like to play, albeit they're a bit short. That's CHLA and Jennifer Howell, I think. Is that it? Mr. Chu, that's it. Ms. Vasquez, we may be finishing a bit earlier today. The court, do you have more witnesses tomorrow? Ms. Vasquez, yes, but they're scheduled to testify tomorrow. The court, just to let you know, if you finish early, I give you all, give you time all the way up to 5.30. Well, that's fair, because she did the same thing um, the other day, or she said the same thing with Elaine. I don't think they ended up um, having extra time. I think they went to the end of the day, but yeah, that's fair, though. Um, I think that was day 21 also. Mr. Chu, we understand we'll take the penalty. The court, you'll take the penalty. Mr. Chu, yes. Miss Bredoff, thank you, Your Honor. Back to open court. The, that's hilarious. Did you see Ch Ben Chu like walking back to the bench? The judge was like, wait, come back. And he was, did okay, jurors get to see keep their notes? Yeah. Generally not. You need to approach for a moment. Okay. Sure. I would. Oh, didn't we just approach? Oh, okay. So the jury comes in and then they approach again, apparently. Do you need to approach for a moment? Okay. Time for another sidebar. Ms. Vasquez, I forgot a witness. Dr. Shaw is here and ready to testify today. Court, is that live? Ms. Vasquez, yes. Ms. Bredoff, we didn't know about that, Your Honor. Ms. Vasquez, you were notified that he would be testifying today, potentially today, if we were running out of time. Court, all right. Ms. Vasquez, sorry, I just forgot off the top of my head. Court, all right, thank you. Back to open court. Um, before lunch, we were talking about your opinions in response to the testimony of Mr. Schnell. Did you also um, analyze the testimony of Ms. Arnold in this case? Yes, I did. And are you aware of her opinion that Arnold Ms. Hurd's career would have followed the same trajectory expert. as that of Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Ana de Armas, and Chris Pine, if not for the Walden statements? Yes. What's your understanding of Ms. Arnold's basis um, for this her is opinion Arnold's that Ms. Hurd's damages should have been similar to that of those identified actors? Um, Ms. Arnold uh, stated that when producers or her industry is looking to uh, hire and there could be uh, talent and actors, that it's important to uh, best understand the, the public's perception of um, the actors that they're considering uh, and that it's important to you know, look into social media uh, to see what what is happening with uh, the actors they're considering for either a movie or even a uh, an endorsement opportunity with companies. Um, so that that was her approach. I like to swear too. And is that the process she followed in providing her analysis of those purportedly comparable actors? No, although she stated that she went in and uh, brought in these comparable. Uh, alleged comparable actors and um, alleged without comparable. really reasoning behind alleged that. comparables. I like that. Did you like, conduct an analysis alleged. based on your expertise in social media and internet analytics of Ms. Heard compared to the actors to whom Ms. Arnold um, compares her? I did. And what did you find? Well, since uh, Ms. Arnold stated that the proper approach is looking at the public perspective, looking into social media. Uh, and, and she did not do that. I felt that was the best approach to do this based on her her words. So, yes, I did go into, uh, you know, best understanding the public perspective of um, Ms. Heard and the alleged comparable actors using Q scores. And then I also went and did some analysis on online and on social media as well. Mr. Banya, what, what point in time do these Q scores represent that are reflected on your demonstrative? So this, uh, these are the winter 2019 Q scores um, that are reflected here. And what was important for me is I, I wanted to find Q scores uh, that represented Miss Heard after Aquaman. And, and remember, Aquaman oh. is December of 2018. These Q scores were gathered January and February of 19 but before the Waldman statements. And what did you find based on the Q scores that you looked at? So as you see here on the left uh, are positive Q scores and, and you know, the higher the number, the better. Uh, as you can Easy see, to understand. Uh, you know, Ms. Godot uh, has the highest Q score out of the, out of the group of uh, actors here uh, at a 28. 
uh, but you're going to notice Ms. Hurd uh, has the lowest positive Q score. Uh, she has a nine. Uh, so I find that um, very interesting that uh, she doesn't appear to fit in as a comparable with these alleged comparable actors. Um, I think what's also interesting <laughs> is the, the average Q score for all actors being scored at that time, which include uh, all the alleged comparable actors here, score uh, at an average of 17. And you can see, again, she is nine well below. I love an average. And then on the right side, you're going to see the negative Q scores. Oh dear. So this is uh, how much people dislike you. Um, you know, so the lower the score is better. Uh, you can see Mr. Momo is over here with the lowest at an eight, but you can see Miss Hurd is over here at a 28, which is was quite a difference. Uh, you know, a 20 oh point difference from Mr. Momoa, uh, and also a 10 point difference. Uh, you know, from the average of all actors, so she is very, very much a little. Uh, her positive score is very low, and her negative score is is Thank very you, high. That means the uh, world to me. Which tells me that she really does, does not fit in as a comparable as it relates to these alleged comparable actors. Oh my. Um, what opinions did you form based on that Q score analysis? Yeah, this is uh, my crush. opinions as it relates to these Q scores is, um, you know, um, Miss Arnold used uh, these uh, actors as allegedly comparable actors. Um, but really listening to her testimony yesterday, it appears that she's abandoned this approach. I don't think she's using these comparable actors or these alleged comparable actors anymore. She's more relying on her um, experience, and I agree with that. Did Ms. Arnold offer a criticism of your use of the Q scores here? She did, yes. And what's your understanding of what that criticism is? Well, what I believe she was saying is that I should have ran Q scores for these allegedly comparable actors not asleep, he's after texting. each of their breakout films. Which, or he's ordering plane tickets. <laughs> um, I disagree. First of all, Sending Q scores home. doesn't work like that. Q scores are available twice a year. So it's not that I could pick a month or a different month for each of, of, of the Q score. Chet, what was Ben um, Chu brying on his actors. phone with his credit card? I want to know. Um, so I feel that, you know, what was for important funny. for me, and this doesn't always happen when, when I'm using Q scores, you can get this per perfect moment in time. As Miss Hurd said, I'm sorry, but as Miss Arnold said that, you know, Aquaman was Miss Hurd's breakout moment. You know, so these I scores reflect that, that breakout moment uh, and, and, and they're terrible Q scores. How would your analysis change if you had used uh, Ms. Arnold's logic with respect to the, the timing of the Q scores that you looked at? I mean, if you really think about what uh, Ms. Arnold was saying is she's saying that she thinks Q scores are the highest for each actor right after their breakout moment. So I would think if anything, uh, these Q scores could have been a bit lower uh, because it's not right after their breakout moment. But what, again, what's important for me is the fact that these scores reflect, you know, who Amber Heard was at the time before the Waldman statements, but after the Aquaman release. Based on my uh, social media and Q score analysis, Miss um, Arnold's comparable, alleged comparable actors are not comparable. And then third, uh, Miss Arnold and Mr. Schnell both failed to prove any causation as it relates to the Waldman statements causing economic harm to Ms. Heard. So, you know, as a damages expert, which um, uh, Ms. Arnold is, uh, you, you need to take into consideration causation before you can calculate damages. You look at damages and you look at this allegedly damaging it's event. It's like causation matters. Not only do you weird. have to prove that 100% of the damage so is because of these Waldman statements, she didn't even consider uh, COVID. It happened at the same time. Somebody, you know, finally! A lot of actors probably made a lot less money because of COVID. Maybe films didn't get Thank made. Thank you! And, you know, when you do, We've do been an asking for days. of damages, you prove causation, but you also have to look at everything else that might have caused this alleged economic harm. And she didn't look into any of that. She didn't even know what causation was. So I don't think of the damages. I'm in the chat. The, I see you. Finally, 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 finally. No further questions, Your Honor. All right. Boom! She didn't even take into account COVID. Boom. Done. Moving on. Somebody had to say it.
We've all been thinking it for Mr. days. Banyan. Good afternoon, Mr. Banyan. COVID uh, has entered the chat. Yeah, you're not a damages expert, correct? I am a damages expert, but not providing any quantitative damages uh, opinions in this case. In this case, okay. And is it your testimony that only if a person repeats the Waldman depth statements, could they be related to the defamation? No, that's not what he said. Say that one more time. Are you saying that a person literally has to repeat the Waldman Depp statements in a, tw in a tweet for them to be related to the defamation? Kelly, thank you. Uh, no, if you looked at my analysis, I did son. pick the three themes as it relates to the tweets, and I uh, analyzed those themes, and I came up with five examples of when th those themes were used. And you ran searches for, quote, abuse hoax, sexual violence hoax, and fake sexual violence. Wow, they're saying that in court quotes, again. Correct. I did. So only if a person used a tweet with those words in that order and with that spacing would they hit on your searches, correct? Objection compound. Overruled. Here's the yeah, thing. Yeah, so cost. I use them in quotes because, you know, there could, the hoax could be used in many other contexts. So I wanted to make sure I was fitting my search with the theme of the Waldman statements. So if someone tweeted misheard faked sexual violence, Yikes. that wouldn't appear in your search. That wouldn't appear in your searches, correct? Faked with an ED. Uh, it would not. Okay. You'd agree that for the winter of 2020, where you took Jason Momoa's Q score, would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman, correct? Well, actually, if I use Ms. Arnold's suggestion, uh, the, the celebrities tend to have, you know, the, the, the celebrity moment right after they have their breakout film. <laughs> oh, so uh, I disagree with that. I think maybe his Q scores could be lower Boom. as it relates to when I use them. Boom. You'd agree he that just for the their own witness against Mr. them. Momoa's Q score would have more time to account for the rise in popularity of the film Aquaman. I don't know if it accounts for the rise of popularity. Again, using Ms. Arnold's uh, words, uh, usually a Q score will be the, the highest after, right after the film, like I did measure Ms. Hurd. Now, you understand that Mr. Waldman has been banned from Twitter for life for harassing Amber Heard, correct? I don't think that states the testimony. I, and I, don't, I think don't know that. that. Assumes uh, facts not in the evidence. Case. They should have objected. And you understand that Mr. Waldman appealed the decision to Twitter and they have confirmed his ban for life? They didn't Objection, say why. Your Honor. May we approach on this one? Okay. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach on this one? The court, okay, sure. Sidebar, Ms. Lickrose. Pretty far beyond the scope of what this expert has testified to and also, Mr. Daniel Hoftis, talking about Waldman and Twitter. Ms. Lickrose, he's not talking about Mr. Waldman's use of Twitter. Mr. Neilhoff, I can move on. Court, okay, move on. Back to open court. Why? You agree that in looking at Mr. Schnell's and they were data, 65% of the uses of negative hashtags relating to Ms. Heard occurred between April 1st, 2020 and June 15th, 2021, correct? Correct. Okay. And you would agree that five of the six highest spikes of the negative hashtags were after the Deb Waldman statements, correct? Correct. Okay. And you, you prepared this chart, correct? Yeah, this was part of my designation. I'd like to have this page um, as a demonstrative. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, I do have an objection. Mm -hmm. That might be heard. All right, if you want to come forward. Mm -hmm. The court, all right, do you want to come forward, please? For a sidebar. Ms. Lickrose, there's a specific reference to the UK ruling on this demonstrative. Mr. Needlehoff, it's in his report, or sorry, it's his report, and he hasn't changed. It's the same information he said in his, one, it doesn't say anything about the UK ruling, but then he put up a chart and he and has testified that the various searches, the court, this is a chart that you made me cut, right? Mr. Needlehoff, no, no, no. <laughs> Ms. Lickrose, so this is responsive to Ms. Arnold's testimony, which is different because the damages period is different, so there is a legacy reference. He did scrub it from the demonstrative that he used today for that purpose. Mr. Nailhoff, your honor, he testified to six different times where he was saying it was not the court. Why don't you just put his chart in he used as a demonstrative? The only reason would be the patient isn't on there, Mr. Nailhoff. But one, the chart doesn't say anything about the UK judgment. The second would be the court, the UK ruling. Mr. Nailhoff, it just says UK ruling. We've been talking about the UK ruling, your honor. He has talked about, in his opinion, Today, he's been saying that none of these searches, that none of the tweets are related to the Waldman statements. The court, okay, Mr. Needlehoft. And then he said that the reason, the way he found 
that was by looking at articles by doing a Google search. That's what he testified to. I don't care so much about his chart, but the articles that he, the court, I'm sorry, are you moving page 99 in or page, this is 99, Mr. Danoff, 99 references articles that he used to determine that the searches were not related. He claims that the searches were not related to the Waldman statements. The court, okay. Mr. Nadelhoff, then 76 are the articles with the titles that include, I mean, I will say that they include something about the court. I didn't know what you were trying to move in, 76. I was just looking at the graph. The graph you're not caring about as much as this, Mr. Nadelhoff. The graph, the graph I don't, I, the graph I don't correct, <laughs> the court. Okay, we're off 99. We're just on 76. Any objection to 76, Ms. Lickrose? I have, I haven't confirmed at the moment. I wasn't aware that was part of it. That has the UK ruling, Mr. Nadelhoff. Here's the thing, Your Honor. He has said, he testified, he testified that the way he determined that, the way he determined that the tweets weren't related to the Waldman statements, the court, I understand your argument, sir, but you're trying to put things in with the UK judgment on it, of course. Just sneak a doodle it on in there. Just a little bit of finagling here and there. No, Mr. Nadelhoff, I know, but why? But why? <laughs> they could have amended their dis disclosures. They never gave us the court. I'm going to sustain the objection. Let's move on. Back to open court. Yep, they're moving on. They're not getting into that. If they were, they would have um, put it up immediately. So the court was other like, than, no, sir. Um, no, sir. Yeah, he just, he's pissed because he lost his request. Okay, something's going on. There's no way they would be taking a break this early. What is happening? No, tell us. Tell us, Rebecca. We want to know. Something is happening. I didn't see him stomp his foot. If they take a break, I'll rewind it and we'll look at it together. I don't know why they're taking a break. Something is up. I hope they are. Oh, right. So just so that we're on the same page, you can have a seat. <laughs> Judge A, I want to be on the same page. Tell us what's happening. All right. Just so we're on the Ooh, same time. page with Give Mr. Time. Knight's testimony. Actually, could Mr. Knight go back out? We need to talk about Please. you, sir. Please leave. So they're dealing with evidentiary issues. That's why they let the jury take the break earlier. All right. All right. So we're on the same page with Mr. Knight's testimony. Um, there is a rule on witnesses. However, Mr. Knight's a rebuttal witness. Um, the purpose of excluding witnesses... Uh, from the courtroom, oh. usually it's a courtroom, is to deprive a, a, a later witness of the opportunity to shape testimony to correspond with that of an earlier witness. Something's going on. Um, the oh. issue we have here, obviously, if it was a direct witness in the direct testimony, you had time to do a rule on witnesses, let them know about the rule on the witnesses. With a rebuttal witness, it's a little different because um, they didn't know they were going to be a witness. A you didn't know they were going to be a witness. I understand that part. The problem is the courtroom in this particular case appears to be the world. So yes. what we have to do here is um, I'm going to do a voir dire and yes. I'm going to allow both sides to ask questions as well of Mr. Knight to see what he has seen of the case. And I'm just going to use the factors um, that the case law in Virginia uses, which uh, the factors to consider because the court does have I will break this time in a minute. to permit or prohibit a witness um, to testify in this particular circumstance. So the factors I'm going to consider is if the impropriety was intentional, which I, we'll find out, uh, the prejudice attached to it. Also, if the excluded witness learned about substantive substantive aspects of the case from an earlier testifying witness and whether wow. that knowledge had any effect on his or her testimony. So those are the three factors All I'm right, going to look at. We need to time this this. Um, So keep that in mind when you do your voir dire. And it's my understanding that the evidence that Mr. Knight will testify only relates to Hicksville. Is that correct? Okay. All right. Now we can have Mr. Knight. Go okay. Ahead. I'm going to try to talk really fast. Here's what it sounds like is happening. Mr. Knight, the next witness that's coming up to testify has something to do with the Hicksville trailer park incident. It is clear that this witness was not given or has seen things on social media. So they are going to voir dire this witness about what they might have seen about right, so Mr. Knight, court. Come forward. So the lawyers in the sworn? court are going to get to ask this witness question to see if this witness is allowed to testify before the jury based on what they've seen on social media. If YouTube comes up, I'm going to fucking die. But this is going on with social media. This is a witness to Hicksville. But the Sir, court, what's what we're doing is I'm just going to ask you a few questions outside the. It's going to explain. The jury, then the attorneys are going to ask you a few questions. This is okay? very and interesting. I'm going to have you step back outside after that. Okay. No problem. All right. What's your full name, sir? Uh, Morgan Higby Knight. Okay, you don't have to be that close. <laughs> All right, how do you spell your last Thanks, name? Thanks, Judge A. 
and IGHT. Okay. All right. And so the sir, judge will ask um, questions first. Before I can allow you to testify, I just want to ask you ooh, a few ooh, questions. Ooh, ooh. Um, have you seen any of the trial that's been going on for the past six weeks? Um, approximately five weeks ago, a friend of mine texted me that Hicksville was mentioned, and I watched a little clip where okay. it was mentioned. Which clip did you watch? Um, I believe it was... Uh, somebody testifying about, I think it was the security guard testifying maybe about Hicksville or, um, I forget exactly who was this testifying, isn't be a big deal. but it was something where Hicksville was mentioned and, uh, it was, uh, about something about a wrist or something like that. Jury is out of the All room. Right. And what did you do after that? Did, at some point did you get in contact with attorneys? So I didn't reach out to them. Um, I didn't, really care the okay. uh the innkeepers that worked at Hicksville before reached out to them and said we saw some stuff that wasn't true and then they asked oh. is it okay if I give the attorneys your phone number so the attorneys reached out to me okay and, and when did the attorneys reach out to you May 3rd May 3rd and you uh, talked to the wow. attorneys at that time yeah yeah wow okay not Camille but um Carolyn <laughs> not Camille. okay and Camille's then famous. have you seen any other parts of the trial no she instructed me not to watch anything about it no i think he might get in on Hicksville or not so i haven't i've been since keeping off off the internet and turning off uh anything that seems to be like it's on social media so i just don't watch any of that wow okay. all right and questions he might get in this is a depth rebuttal witness so mr knight you were contacted by an attorney for mr depp on may 3rd Yes. Okay. And you said it was Carolyn? Gerilyn. Gerilyn. Oh, Gerilyn. I got it. Okay. And what... I think it's pronounced Gerilyn. Okay. Can you tell us <laughs> the conversation you had with her at that time? Yeah. She um, just asked me my recollection of the evening, and I told her, and she said, Not a okay, lame pronouncing um, you testifying? And I said, sure. And she said... Uh, Okay, well then, we're not sure if we're going to call you or not, but just in case, please don't watch anything having to do with the case. And I said, I will do. You guys, this is so interesting. Um, I can't believe this is happening. Now, how is it that... This is happening because this trial your was best televised. Knowledge, how is it that Gerilyn was able to get hold of you? How, how, did, how did she know That's that speculative. you... That's speculative. So... Like I said, two of my innkeepers, my innkeeper and my manager had reached out to her team, um, I think through email. And one of them uh, texted me and said, hey, do you mind if we give Gerilyn This your happened number? because this trial is televised. Now, That's why this witness is here. You uh, on Twitter, did you not, about this case? Yeah, two weeks prior to Gerilyn reaching out to me, um, someone had made a comment about something that happened by the fire pit. And I said, that's not my recollection. I didn't see, that's not, that's not what I saw. So who was it that made a comment about something? Like that the fuck if I know it's pit? Twitter. So once um, I was told about uh, the fact that Hicksville was mentioned, I went and did a Twitter search of Hicksville trailer. So it was, I don't know who it was, but I was just like, what are they saying about Hicksville? And so, that was um, why I did a search just to see because it was weird and fascinating because the night to me um, wasn't that remarkable. This is in a the witness of all the different experiences I've had at the trailer palace. Who is a surprise? So explain to me, because please, what you mean I'll by break it down you did break. a trailer search. She so if you go to Twitter and you put in keywords and do a search, all the um, tweets regarding this that so subject good. come up or anything with those keywords in it. So that is how I found the tweet that I replied to. Okay. Guys. And how many tweets did you find that mentioned Hicksville when you did that trailer search? What the fuck is he supposed to remember that like all six. I only replied oh, to one of them. Really? Okay. That's it? And what do you recall those tweets saying about Hicksville? Um, the one that I replied to said that uh, there was some incident by the fire pit and uh and johnny was yelling at amber 
Um, and I replied that my, that I didn't see that I was there all night and I was, you know, I was working that night. So I didn't see anything like that. So your best recollection on that one was that somebody said somebody was testifying that Johnny was yelling at Amber. Yeah. And I, I believe, um, grabbed her or something along those lines. Do you recall who said Johnny was yelling at Amber and grabbed her? I have no idea it was a stranger, so I didn't really pay attention to who was writing it. All right. And you said that you responded to it. How did you respond to it? On Twitter. I that's said that's we're talking about. not what happened. I was there all night. Um, uh, yeah, basically. I'm that, paraphrasing. It was. A, a did you say ago. anything about what you thought happened? I just said that didn't happen. I didn't say what I mean, I think I believe I said maybe something along the lines of uh, from what I saw, Amber was the one acting jealous, not Johnny. Wow. And you said this to one of the tweets. Well, yes, he tweeted it. Whether that was the umbrella man. I don't recall. That's a ridiculous name, though. Okay. <laughs> so tell me about the other five. <laughs> no, uh, justice for Tug. When you the umbrella man. Search. Um, I think they were similar in nature, but I didn't, I don't specifically remember the details of them. Uh, that was pretty much the only one I remembered and that's the only one I replied to. Do you remember anything about the other five and what was said? No. Okay. When you said that somebody told you about a security guard, what was your understanding of what the security guard said? Wow. Um, I just, I got a text that uh, somebody in the trial had said. Is this uh, real life? That they were talking about Trailer Palace at, during the trial. And so that's what led me to go on Twitter and do a search. He worked there. And did you have any communications with the two innkeepers about what you knew or what you thought? No, I haven't talked to them in years and so, still haven't regarding the case. So... How is it that the wow. innkeepers then contacted you and said, do you mind wow. if we give you wow. the telephone wow. to the attorneys? Because they still have me in their phone. And um, Christy, who was the manager at the time, is the one that texted me and said, um, hey, do you mind if we pass this along? They, um, Mr. Depp's attorneys want to talk to you. Wow. Do you mind if we pass what along? Your phone number. Right. But how is it that, what is the communication you had with the innkeepers? That communication that only. even led they texted. to understand that you believed you had knowledge about. This doesn't happen. Hicksville, the Hicksville incident. We're not here, but for there this was no being televised. They knew because they were both working that same night. Um, Jenna was the innkeeper and she was there along with me that night. Christy was the one who texted me and she had come in the following morning for her shift. And I slept over. I was um, living in Keeper that night. So I want to go to Hicksville. I'm trying to understand. So <laughs> just based on the fact that seven years ago, they happened to know that you were working that night. Nine years ago. And it's because okay. I was there okay. with them. My math. Well, it's, it's because I remember Johnny Depp right coming now, to where I fucking work. What year? Oh, that was 2013. 2013. You're right. Okay. I, I still so, remember Michael Keaton well, coming to where I worked. Out of the blue, they remembered nine years and that was, ago. Uh, that that you were there that night and that you might have 16 years some ago? I mean, to be honest, like, we do get um, celebrities sometimes. Yeah, you had the high pass there. I saw it on the show. was, shelf. you know, it's not that unmemorable. It's not like it's any other night of the week. It's Johnny so fucking sure Depp, the Elaine. specifics of that night. Had Mr. Depp's attorneys ever attempted to contact you before? No. Had you they ever didn't know attempted he existed. to contact Mr. Depp's attorneys before? No, I had no interest. All right. Have so you many had notes. any conversations with Mr. Depp's attorneys other than the one you described with Geraldine? Um, since? Yes. Well, I met with Camille last night. All right. And what did you, what was that conversation? Please describe. I just want to remember. Um, you know, the story again that I had told Geraldine. Mm -hmm. And let's let's hear what that story was. You want me to go through? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, Your Honor, we would object to attorney yep. work product. There's no attorney work product. No, I'll overrule that. Right. Sorry. They don't know about this witness because this is rebuttal where shit gets real. Yeah, sure. They don't know. They don't have a um, statement. They don't have a depo. I 
They're flying I blind. I described like them getting to the trailer palace. Uh, Elaine's the, trying to figure out what is happening. Uh, me showing them around the interactions I had when I was on duty with Mr. Depp and Mr. Her- or Miss Heard. Um, how uh, the evening progressed throughout the night, the levels of drinking and drug use that I witnessed, um, <laughs> the uh, um, wow. what the state of the damaged trailer the next morning, um, and basically oh, just yeah, the details that I, I the jury's I'd not there only, for this. Um, you know, jury's on break total. 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp um, and Miss Heard throughout the e- throughout the entire course of the night. So it was my um, recollection of those events. Chat, I'm time. loving celebrity sightings at work. Keep going. And I love it. what did Ms. Vasquez say to you? Your Honor, this is a beyond, we object That's to the grounds that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire. Yeah. No, just limited to whatever the three she said. Hey, Elaine, May I very, please finish let him finish, line. Elaine. Line. Go ahead. Yes, sir. The objection is that it's beyond the scope of the voir dire, Your Honor, enumerated the three criteria which are relevant here. And this is a rebuttal witness, so. Your Honor, whatever Ms. Vasquez shared with him is no. going to be very important. It's work product, Elaine. This time he was going to be a witness. So well, that, that was last night. So. How right. does that fit into one of the three factors? Of it doesn't. Gonna it well, doesn't. One of the three factors, you're, well, if you're this on that one, approach so that the witness doesn't hear. Okay, that's fine. If, holy shit, <laughs> this is a day in court, people. Miss <sighs> Bredhoff, well, one of the three factors, Your Honor, may I approach the, so that the witness doesn't hear the court? Okay, that's fine. Sidebar, the court. I'm just determining these three factors, Miss Bredhoff, and I understand that, but if they... If Ms. Vasquez has shared any of the information that any of the witnesses said, the court, you can ask if she shared any information about what other witnesses said. If you want to ask that question, I think that's fair. Ms. Vasquez, we don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. Mr. Chu, thank you, Your Honor. The court, uh-huh. Back to open court. But none of this counts against time. This is litigation. This is not witness questioning. Mr. The judge Knight, asked for a voir dire. Yes. Ms. Vasquez uh, provide you with any information so we'll see if he testifies. that anyone had testified to or that's a fair question said at any point narrowly tailored no she didn't talk about anything except for asking me my experience and and just getting a clear understanding of what my experience was she didn't mention anything outside of the scope of what i saw and just asked me for the facts and told me to tell the truth just tell the truth and let me know you know do you know what, what any you always of the tell the witnesses? Witness. Tell the truth in this trial about. I mean, outside of what I, I described racing. earlier, with the um, a friend of mine texting that someone was talking about Trailer Palace. I do not. Do you know? I'm rooting for this guy to come in. Witnesses testified about any jealousy. Uh, other than the tweet that I replied to, no. That I love this dude. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, may we approach? All right. Well, do you have any questions? Oh. All right. Sir, so if you could ha- have a seat back outside the courtroom. Sure. Thank you. Oh, Deb's team's boss. not asking any yes, questions. Okay. Oh, the court. Sir, if you can have a seat outside the courtroom. Um, the witness, um, sure. Can I leave my water? The court, yes, you can leave your water. During this sidebar. Miss Bredoff. So first, Your Honor, it was 19 days between when they learned he may be a witness. Really, like, I just feel like we've just done this a trillion times today. The court, but they said they might not use him as a rebuttal witness. They don't have to provide you with witnesses that they think they might provide as rebuttal. That's not a rule. Ms. Bradoff, Your Honor, if I may, there was no, according to Mr. Knight, there was no communications with Ms. Vasquez until last night. They supplemented him on Sunday, so they obviously knew he was going to be a witness. The court, on Sunday, they knew he was going to be a rebuttal witness. Ms. Bradoff, right. But if they didn't talk to him until last night, if they didn't know he was going to be a rebuttal witness back when they talked to him on May 3rd, then the fact that they talked to him last night would have been after they already identified him. The court, right. They can identify him as a rebuttal witness and then speak with him before he testifies. I don't see what the issue is. Miss Bredoft. Then the second issue, Your Honor, is once he... Sounds like that first one wasn't an issue, but whatever. And the second issue, Your Honor, is once he learns that Hicksville has been raised here, he runs a trailer search and he can't remember any of the others, but this one, Your Honor, the court, it's uh, indiscernible. I can see it. Miss Bradoff, I think it's very important because here we have the umbrella guy saying Johnny Depp will be accused of being jealous. 
because a woman was sitting close to Amber heard, Depp said that she had taken happy something, and then Depp was accused of removing her hand and yelling at Amber. Then she responds back, that never happened. I was with them all night, and Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy, so he's commenting on this, and he knows what the testimony is. The court again, on that day, it hadn't happened yet. It had not happened yet. It was April something. Miss Vasquez, 21st. The court hadn't happened yet, so he's not commenting on testimony that happened in this trial. He's commenting on whatever that person posted. Miss Brown, after your honor, I think this is manifestly unfair. Like, just ignoring what was just said. You know, this is manifestly unfair and prejudicial to us. Hicksville has been around for years here. Years, I say. And the fact that they suddenly, out of the blue, want to call and talk to him, you know, in the middle of this trial makes no sense at all. We even had a court order that uh, that said they had to provide whatever receipts they have for the damage to Hicksville. They gave us nothing. Obviously, they would have had to investigate that. Well, they, hopefully they called um, Squirrely Investigations LLC, just saying. Miss Vasquez, we will hear why. Trust me, everyone will hear why. The court. If we can bring the focus back to these factors where we're at now. Miss Bradoff, all right, Your Honor. The court. So these are the factors. So do you have anything else to say about the factors? Miss Bradoff, so Your Honor, impropriety. The fact that they knew on May 3rd and didn't testify until, or sorry, the fact that they knew on May 3rd and didn't identify until May 22nd, I thought, the court, it's the impropriety of the witness. Let's just focus on the witness. Miss Bradoff, then I think searching trailers to find out what's been said about Hicksville, I think that suggests he's trying to find out more information. The court, I'm sorry, Miss Bradoff. Miss Bradoff, no, it's okay. The second thing, Your Honor, wait, isn't this the third thing? Oh, my God. Counting is hard, I know. Your Honor, is the prejudice to us. If we had known on May 3rd, we could have said, Your Honor, you know, let us do a 30-minute deposition of him or something so we can at least prepare for this so we know something here. You know what Miss Vasquez has learned of substantial. Mr. Chu, no effect, I think, is the fair criteria. Miss Bradoff, so now we're going to have this person who's going to testify, you know, that he has knowledge, and we've had no opportunity for discovery or prepare or find another rebuttal witness beyond that. The court, that's what rebuttal witnesses are. Mr. Chu, Your Honor, there's no impropriety whatsoever. He is not subject to the rule on witnesses. There's clearly no prejudice to the defendant, and there's no effect on his testimony. He's going to say exactly what his recollection was. What they're objecting to is he's going to tell the truth, and the truth is inconsistent with what Miss Hurd has said. Bam! Thick burn by you, Mr. Chu. The court. Anything further? Miss Brahawk, aye. The court, well, weighing the factors in this matter. Judy, can you hear me okay? Weighing the factors in this matter. I don't think the party intentionally wasn't subject to the rules and as soon as he was contacted about possibly being a rebuttal witness he did not watch anything he hasn't learned anything substantive aspects of the case from any earlier identifying or sorry testifying witnesses other than the security guard he's testified he heard something about the security guard but other than that nothing would shape his testimony to correspond with any earlier witness and if there's any prejudicial value, the probative value outweighs the prejudice. Mr. Chu, thank you, Your Honor. The court, at this point, I'll allow him to testify. The witness will be very limited. Do you understand? Mr. Chu, yes, Your Honor. The court, all right. Back to open court. We go. Oh, my goodness. The judge is like, no, Elaine. Look at the eyebrows. No, Elaine. That's not how this works. I think this witness comes in. I want this witness to come in. I think this witness comes in. But this is the Perry Mason moment. What's happening? What's happening? Right. So based on weighing the factors, I'm going to allow yes! to testify. If we could get Mr. Knight back in. I'm a big fan of justice, Judge A. If I knew you were going to do a sidebar, I wouldn't have made him leave. Yeah, she know. could have just done it in open court. Uh, we would have loved it if it had just been in open court, Judge A. We wanted to hear the lawyers argue. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. So they must have flown him out there. Um, so you could just stay you could just stay there while we get the jury okay on a wing and a prayer the jury's jury? coming back in let's go i'm okay. yeah. and this is okay. the problem for this is the problem this is the problem for team herd this shit yeah. can happen in rebuttal because we're going to swear them in again in front of the jury okay and they do not have a lot of time left this is not helpful for their case and for apportioning the rest of their time. They do not have the fucking wiggle room to deal with this. You guys, I'm just so All right. shook Let's that see. we're getting a mic drop right, thank moment. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the interruption. Shook. You're going to notice as we get closer to the end of the testimony, you're probably going to have some more interruptions, and I, I apologize for that. But There's just some matters we have to take up outside your presence, okay? All right, thank you. Wow. All right, your next witness. All right. Mr. Knight, if you could come forward to be sworn. Oh, and it's a Camille witness. I feel like that's a double bonus. Also, we banked. Thank you. Spirit, welcome 
testify truthfully in this case on penalty of law. Thank you. Sir, if you have a seat. This poor guy must be so nervous. He seemed really mellow on board here, though. Good afternoon, Mr. Knight. Good afternoon, Camille. Would you please state <laughs> your full name for the record? Morgan Higby Knight. He's all of us. Camille's Mr. Knight. Great. Where are you from? I live in Los Angeles, California. And what do you do for a living? So I currently own and run Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast in Idlewild, California. And I created and ran uh, Hicksville Trailer Palace in Joshua Tree, California, starting in 2009. And how is Hicksville Pines Bud and Breakfast different from Hicksville Trailer Palace? Did he say bed? So Hicksville bud? Pines Bud and Breakfast bud and is breakfast? Um, up in the mountains of Idlewild, which is a beautiful Weed? like snow town above Palm Springs. And um, all the units are A-frames instead of trailers, which we have. It's obviously a very different climate than Joshua Tree, which is a desert area. It sounds cute. Um, the rooms, which are themed at both places, are uh, trailers, finished trailers from the 50s through the 70s at Hicksville Trailer Palace. So um, there's also different kind of amenities. There's a pool in Joshua Tree. Um, there's a rec room up at uh, Hicksville Pines. When did you first become the owner of the Trailer Palace? Trailer Palace, I started building it in 2009. It took about a year with uh, my collaborator, Stephen Butcher, and on the trailers. And we got done and opened um, in 2010. Did there come a time that you sold the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, I did at the beginning of 2020. I um, had some health issues and just it was too much to run both at the same time. So I chose... Idlewild because Relate. it was newer and shinier. Relate. And just for my Relate sake, 100. Um, how long did you own the trailer palace? So 10 years of us being open, 11 years total. Relate, relate, And what relate. was the Hicksville trailer palace? So um, it started out as a uh, artist retreat. I was a filmmaker at the time and wanted a place to get away and work on film projects outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I also put in a recording studio so musicians could record records there. Uh, I had lived in New Orleans for five years and there's an amazing recording studio there called Kingsway where all the yes! musicians would come and they'd live in this big mansion and record their records. I and I just thought that was a really Kingsway. neat thing for artists to be able to get away and create their um I want his life story, too. they're working on. Camille, ask his life story. Over the course of the uh, build-out of all the trailers, themed trailers, which I'm a huge fan of this hotel called Madonna Inn. And uh, yes! so I wanted to do really detailed themed trailers. That it became so much too sense. expensive to just make a living off of an artist retreat. So I decided before I was done to make it a hotel as well. And what were your job responsibilities, generally speaking, when you owned the Hicksville Trailer Palace? So I would um, be live-in manager some nights, um, a couple nights a week. I would also drive out from Los Angeles twice a week and bring supplies that you can't get out in the Yucca Valley area and Joshua Tree. Um, there's just a lot of things like, you know, Smart and Finals, Costco's and stuff. So I would drive that stuff out. Um, there's also no this makes uh, so much sense. USPS. So Sometimes I'd have to get things shipped to my house and drive them out as well. Uh, I would also just do um, constantly building and creating new stuff at Trailer Palace, uh, whether it's new trailers or amenities. So I would be working on that stuff as well. I'm a big fan of the fact that Disneyland is always making it better and better. We're a big fan of you right now. And when you were the live-in manager, fan. Does, does that mean that you spent the night at the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Yeah, we have a house on site um, where the recording studio was, and there's a bedroom in there. So whoever is live-in manager those nights um, stays in the house and, and basically lives there. There's a kitchen and everything. Have you ever met the plaintiff in this case, Mr. Depp? I had met him really briefly at the Viper Room in the late 90s. Um, <laughs> 
uh, there's the Viper Room. I think that's the first time that's come up. People that perform there and was good friends with uh, this girl Robin from the Pussycat Dolls and um, some other friends in this band, the Imposters. So I was there and I met him once. Depp's fascinated by this dude's life story. Never met her. I had never met her before. Um, They were guests at the hotel. When was the first time that you met? I didn't have Pussycat Dolls on my bingo card for today. Um, Nor Viper Room. In late May 2013. Uh, when they were guests, uh, Mr. Depp's assistant Nathan had rent out the entire place so they could have a night um, there in privacy. What do you I recall need to do that. anything I'm gonna about need to do Mr. That. Depp I'm gonna need to do that. arrival to the Hicksville Trailer Palace? Mr. Well, Depp got lost. Uh, so um, his security guard who arrived early asked Tracks. me if I could go fetch them because <laughs> he had an old car that... Um, didn't really fare on the dirt roads out there, which are pretty horrible. So um, I went out and made sure that they got themselves and the car back to Hicksville safely. That would be me. Do you remember approximately at what time that was? It was three to four in the afternoon. What was Mr. Depp's demeanor when they first arrived? I like Camille's question at so much. Trailer Palace, he was super excited about the place, really complimentary, um, just had a lot of questions and um I bet he enjoyed was, it. Just seemed like he was in a really great mood. And how about Miss Hurd's demeanor? Anything stick out? She was pretty quiet. Um if he calls her a spoiled she, uh, teenage uh, child, I'm gonna lose my shit. Didn't say that much when I was giving them the tour of the grounds and the trailer. And was anyone else with Mr. Depp and Miss Hurd when they first arrived? Uh there's people that are arriving throughout the afternoon. So um I thought he was, said bud uh, and breakfast. Thank you. Um, but I think 10 to 12 people total ended up staying. I love uh, that. The security guard had gotten there earlier and just to check out the place. But, um, but yeah. And did I understand your testimony previously that the entire trailer park was rented out by Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Yeah, the whole place slept, I believe at the time, about 25 people, but there was only 10 to 12 in this party. And who was part of that party besides Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? Um, I'm really horrible with names, but really? I remember one of them was uh, Miss Hurd's sister and the security guard I mentioned before, but I honestly forgot his name too. He's like, I don't know. What happened when Mr. Depp and Miss Hurd first came onto the property? So um, I gave them a tour of, we give all guests a tour of their specific trailer and the grounds and um, show them around the uh when someone rents the whole place, they get uh, another trailer called the bar trailer, which is basically a place to set up their alcohol and stuff. And I'm going to go back and watch or just putting their beverages in that area. The Hype House show and when they went to Hicksville. And where were you when uh, Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd... Because now I need to see it again. Did there come a time when Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd went to the bar trailer? Um, I didn't notice most of the time that my interactions with them. Everything's kind of centrally located. So there's a fire pit, bar trailer, and picnic tables all right in the same area so they were generally around that area the entire evening that I saw them. And what did you observe of Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd as the evening progressed? Um, so Mr. Depp was super uh, just super curious and really nice. Um, he was also really interested in my innkeeper because she was a musician so they would talk about music a lot. At one point, uh, the innkeeper who lived at the next door property went home and grabbed her guitar and they had um, sung a song or two around the campfire. Oh my God, I love uh, this. In the early evening. Were there s'mores? Um, There's another instance where Mr. Depp, the innkeeper, her name is Jenna, and myself were talking about books and music. And Miss Heard came over and kind of interjected. She seemed a little annoyed that. Um, Mr. Depp wasn't oh, spending oh, time with her. Oh. What about Ms. Hurd's demeanor made you think that she was annoyed? Um, I think just generally she... Uh, I wonder if the jury picked up. It's hard. Like she, I think... Uh, I don't know. It, it was just it was just like a gut reaction. Like I, I, I can't describe it. But... Um, you know. Oh boy. How long were you with Mr. Depp and Miss Heard that evening? Oh boy. 
generally. So throughout the course of the evening, I was probably 40, mostly with Mr. Depp, but 45 minutes to an hour total. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, that's over the whole course until the end of the night I dropped my after pen. the check-in. Okay. And did you have an opportunity to observe Mr. Depp, Depp interact with other people, guests on the property that evening? Yes, um, I saw him hanging out with his security guard she at one point fighting. and um, yes. outside of the uh, time that him and Jenna were singing around the campfire, he was off by himself um, a lot of the time and Miss Hurd was over at the, uh, at the um, campfire with her friends and seemed to have a good time. That seems about right. And if you haven't already, can you generally describe for the jury your observations of Miss Heard that evening? Um, yeah, she was. Uh, Taylor, she that's was seemed to be having a really nice time with her friends around the campfire, um, and yeah, everyone was in a pretty good mood. Did there come a time in the evening that you observed Mr. Depp and Miss Heard have a disagreement or an argument? A disagreement. Yes. Um, yeah, an argument. I was speaking with Mr. Depp, uh, just one on one, talking about Hicksville, and um, Did the lyrics Ms. of OPP Heard, just flashed uh, came in my over, head? and she yep. said that I want to talk to you, and seemed really upset about something. So I went and um, back in the house because it was really um, they went off on their own, and they she started yelling at him, and I I didn't want to hear it. It honestly was really triggering because I've been in an uh, emotionally abusive Objection. relationship before. Objections. Move to strike. Oh, no. Amber Heard triggered him. You're up for me. We reproach. Okay, sure. Oh, no. Amber Heard triggered him. Let the man speak. Oh, Morgan Knight, the topic of this sidebar. <laughs> okay, here we go. This spread off. So he's testified that she was yelling and he said he wanted to go away because he's been in an abusive relationship before your honor, that's not appropriate for the jury. It's non-responsive to the question. It's prejudicial and it's hearsay. Ms. Vasquez, why is it hearsay? Great question. The court, it's not hearsay. Ms. Product, but it's non-responsive to the statement. The court, non-responsive. I'll sustain it's non-responsive. Ms. Vasquez, okay, back to him court. Can you please just explain for us what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard having an argument? Yeah, he was triggered. Yes. He um, was triggered. So, Ms. Heard asked him to go talk um, off to the side, and she was upset at him, and she was yelling at him. Um, and I personally had been in objection. A, All right, I'll sustain the objection. Okay. okay. If you could just explain to the jury what you saw, um, what you observed when you saw Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard having an argument. Okay. Um, he was kind of cowering and seemed almost afraid and um wow it was really like odd to see because he was older than her obviously so um but i just went back in the house because i didn't objection wanna... to what he did all right i'll sustain it i went back in the house he said i went back in the house so after you observed the argument fair to say you went back to the trait to your house on site. yes i did yeah okay um, what happened after that? So when I saw Mr. Depp um, on my next rounds, he apologized profusely and said, I'm really sorry about that. She was upset. Objection, because... Your Honor, hearsay. Sustained. Next question. What, if any, type of reaction did Mr. Depp have? He was just Objection, really... Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. He's going to say it again. It's the reaction. It's, it's not the, reaction. the statement. All right, if you could make that clear. Yeah. Elaine, just what type of say it again. physical reaction did Mr. Depp have after the argument between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd? He honestly, throughout the rest of the night, became a lot more quiet and um, and was uh, just very more petulant. In the beginning of the night, he um, was a lot more outgoing and extroverted. And throughout, as the course of the night went on, he was less and less so and more quiet. Did you observe any of the guests consuming alcohol while on the property? Um, I assume they were. I mean, people had cups and there was alcohol set up in the bar trailer, but I didn't 
physically see them pour alcohol into their cup and cup go into the mouth per se. That's fair. Did you witness Mr. Depp drink any alcohol that evening? I couldn't say. Elaine absolutely has Anything the mic working. Anything about Mr. Depp's demeanor that made you think he was perhaps intoxicated? Yes. Um, as the night went on, he, uh, I am a former bar owner. So I'm, even though I wasn't drinking that night, I'm very familiar with the uh, signs. So um, just as the night went on, like I said, he became more and more quiet, but I he also, as granted. we would have conversations, his uh, head would kind of sway a little bit back and forth, which was a little, you know, it was he was much less sharp than he was earlier in the night. Did Miss Hurd Fair. appear intoxicated to you? Um, she did. Uh, she seemed, I think when she was angry at him, it, it seemed like she was intoxicated, but that's just based on my experience and my own personal trauma dealing with abuse. Wow, there it is. Your Honor, move to strike. All right, I'll sustain the objection. We'll strike it from the record. Please disregard that testimony. Of his own. Did you observe anyone do or take drugs? I did not. Did you witness Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd interact other than the argument that you previously described for the jury? Um, the, at the end of the night, I heard a commotion. I was inside the house and came out. I couldn't tell what was going on. Um, and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd were having a discussion about, um, about I, I'm not sure what, but then they went to their trailer. At that point, a lot of people had already gone to bed. So um, it, it just kind of petered out. Everyone went to bed, including myself, and I didn't hear anything else the rest of the night. What time did the evening come to an end? I'd say it was almost around 3 a.m. Did you ever see Mr. Depp no. grab anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Leading. Sustain. Did you ever see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection leading. No. Sustain. Next question. Did you ever witness Mr. Depp get angry that evening? Objection leading. Sustain. <laughs> what if anything happened the next morning? <laughs> there um, we go. The next morning, we have what to check out the news next? at the time. Uh, before COVID. And so uh, around 11 o'clock, one of my innkeepers let me know that there was some damage. Objection, hearsay? No, it goes to state of mind and it goes to um, what he did next. Did something happen that caused you to go to Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer? Yes, I was informed. That Objection, hearsay? It's not being offered for the truth, Your Honor. It's not. May we approach on this okay, one topic? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Sidebar, Ms. Vasquez, he needs to be able to testify that he was called or summoned to the trailer to observe the damage to the court, okay? Ms. Vasquez, so he's just going to say that his innkeeper informed him that there was damage. He needed to go assess it. That's it. Not being offered for the truth. Ms. Broduft, it is offered for the truth. The court, don't you want to hear about damage? Ms. Vasquez, don't you want that? <laughs> Ms. Broduft, yes. The court, well, then let him talk about the damage. Let him tell them about the damage, rather. Ms. Broduft. I'll withdraw, Ms. Vasquez. Thank you. Back to him court. It's just, oh, it's just going to the fact that there's a reason he went to the trailer. He's going to talk about what he observed, but you have to figure out why he went to the trailer. And this is a reaction in real time because they haven't done a deposition on what this witness. What happened next morning, Mr. Knight? Uh, the innkeepers let me know that there was some damage in one of the trailers and it happened to be Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's trailer. So I wanted to inspect the uh, trailer because I was extremely worried. Um, yeah. All those trailers that Steve and I worked on were like my babies and um, the one they were staying in was the only one that was mostly original and restored 1950s style. And so I was... Uh, Worried. Very concerned. <laughs> yeah. So what did you observe when you went to the trailer? I observed that um, there was a light sconce by the bathroom um, in the bedroom that had been broken off the wall and a couple pieces were on the floor and they were, um, and yeah, it was basically just broken. The light fixture was hanging on the wall still, except for the pieces that were on the floor. Did you come to understand how that happened? Objection. Yeah. Foundation and right, foundation. I'll just say that's the foundation. How he knew that was 
what she was Did you ask doing. how the sconce was broken? Objection hearsay sustained. How often do light fixtures in the trailers break? Spontaneously. Um, they break uh, pretty often. I mean, it's not like a usual thing, but things in the trailers generally get broken because it's all vintage trailers. And um, I would say as much as every couple weeks, there's some incident of damage in one of the trailers. In this case, Mr. Depp had told me that. Objection. Just, objection. Um, so anyway, yes. Beyond the light fixture, was anything else in the trailer damaged? No, everything else looks fine. In fact, we have a, a something we call a piggy money. fee uh, that we address to guests that if there's anything, what we call inconsiderate or unusually large messes, we charge them extra for it for a $25 piggy an fee? hour cleaning fee, <laughs> but they did not receive one of those because everything outside of light fixture looks fine. A piggy fee. And what was your reaction to seeing the damaged light fixture? Um, to be honest, I was relieved because it was not a big deal. I just tucked, there was already another light in the room. So I just tucked the wires in the wall until I had a few months later time to, um, I, it was matching sconce with another one in the room. So I had to on eBay find a matching pair that would fit there. And, uh, when I finally got around to it, I was able to get that and charge it to, uh, Nathan who had, whose credit card I had. And what was your understanding of who Nathan was? Mr. Depp's assistant. Okay. And what did you charge Nathan or Mr. Depp for replacing that, that pair of light fixtures? The pair came out to $62. Wow. $62 in damage for the trailer that was devastated While you were on and site, destroyed. Um, Mr. Knight, did you ever wear a mesh shirt? <laughs> No, I would uh, absolutely never wear that. <laughs> At any time during Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's stay on the property, did you see Mr. Depp become physical with anyone? Objection I did not. leading. No. No. That's, that's fine. I'm sorry, that answer was. Uh, I, I never saw Mr. Depp get physical with anyone when I saw him. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Cross examination. Nothing Thank further. You. Oh, boy. Elaine, the jury Mr. likes Knight, this witness. You Don't wreck yourself. You're a pretty big fan of Johnny Depp, aren't you? I am not. <laughs> to be honest, uh, throughout the evening, I... Uh, I sorry, I, I just asked you one question. Oh, I, I, I didn't apologize. ask you the rest of that. I you apologize. wanted to participate in this trial, didn't you? I did not. I you was knew? asked by the attorney, mm -hmm. and I wanted to... They. Um, asked me and I said, I'll be happy to come and tell the truth. You knew this was on camera. Well, I'll be happy to come tell the truth. To a lot of people and you Elaine? saw testimony, did you not in this case? And you seized the moment and responded Compound. to the umbrella guy, the lead <gasps> person for Mr. Depp's Twitters. Did you not? Objection, what? Honor. Argumentative compound. Objection, what the fuck just happened? Uh, Mr. Umbrella Guy is the lead <laughs> The lead you what? know that he is he is one of the most predominant pro depth Twitters. What out is there. happening? I have no idea. I don't care or follow the umbrella guy. In fact, you do look at Depp. Depp, don't stare down. A Twitter called Johnny Depp fan, don't you? Absolutely not. You don't. That's your testimony no. under oath. It is my testimony under oath. All right. I'll be happy and to come on tell the April, truth. 21st, Mr. Oh, Elaine. Depp testified in the on, Elaine. Hicksville, didn't he? I wasn't here. And in fact, you tweeted in response to the umbrella guy <laughs> on <laughs> April 21, 22. Quote, that never happened. I was with them all night. Amber was the one acting all jealous and crazy. There's no yes, I umbrella do guy that? Twitter. I do recall writing that. Michelle, can well, you bring that up, please? We're going to call it Defendants 1903. What did she call? What did she say Tug was? The umbrella guy is the leading, is Depp's Twitter? Uh, what? What? And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to redact. Leave in the umbrella guy. <laughs> the this day. is a mess. This is kind of a delicious mess, and though. I'm not mad at this mess. Still. No piggy fee on this I'm mess. But, but she's not reading the room. 
because the jury likes this guy and you heard the laughter and the judge did not deal with the laughter. Um, the judge didn't even talk about them. Oh, don't feel bad for Tug. This is great advertisement for Tug's channel. I think this is brilliant. Um, but what leading pro depth Twitter guy. Okay. That's what she well, said. She's working on that. I'm shocked. But this guy's like, I said, I'd be happy to come in. He's called Matters of Consequence back in 1999. What? I did. And didn't Mr. Depp's first wife, Lorianne Allison, work as a makeup artist on that? She absolutely did. And while we're looking at that, uh, four days after you tweeted to Umbrella Man. <laughs> you I was Umbrella Guy. <laughs> umbrella Guy. Okay. Well, all right. Now we have this up. I'm going to ask you to take a look. What is Defendant's Exhibit 1903? Do you see that? I do. Okay. And that's from <sighs> that umbrella guy on 421. Oh, now we've gotten to that correct? umbrella guy. Correct. And it says bringing in the Hicksville incident accusations. Do you see that? I do. And there's clearly Mr. Depp testifying there, likely a video, right? Okay. And you respond, that never happened. I was with them all night. That's the same Amber Twitter. was the one acting all jealous and crazy. Do you see that? Why would she bring you in? Your Honor, I'm going to move the admission of defendants 1903. This isn't going to help. Yeah, Your Honor, we believe the first part of the um, that umbrella guy's tweet should be redacted. unredacted. Oh. For redacted. context. Unredacted for context. It, 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 I have no it, idea what it, I was replying it, to. It's, it's hearsay. It's, it's rank hearsay in the context. It's Your rank hearsay. hearsay. It's context. Today has gotten so fucking spicy. Uh Ms. Vasquez, Your Honor, the court approach. Get over here now. Sidebar. Ms. Vasquez, there's more to, I mean, she can't argue hearsay for part of the tweet and not the other part of the tweet. The court, you should give all of it, Ms. Vasquez, or none of it, the court. The objection to hearsay in bringing the Hicksville incident, or if you want to bring all of it in, that's fine, Ms. Broft. Then let's take out the bringing in the Hicksville court. That's part of the response, Ms. Broft. I need the umbrella guy in and Mr. Depp's picture. All of that can come in, right? The court, well, the picture can come in, Ms. Broft. And that umbrella guy, Ms. Vasquez, I have no, no objection to that umbrella guy, Ms. Broft. So just taking out, bringing in the Hicksville, Ms. Vasquez. Yeah, thank you, the court. Right, back to the court. Thanks. So you reached out to the umbrella guy in this text this week. He replied Twitter, to a tweet, Elaine. I wouldn't call it reaching out. It's not how Twitter works, Elaine. And in fact, the umbrella guy is in Mr. A Mr. Adam Waldman. Do you know who Adam Waldman is? I have no idea. Well, he's testified earlier that he talks to the umbrella guy. He talks to the umbrella guy? Yeah. Were you aware of that? <laughs> like in his sleep? I, honestly, this sounds like a like schizophrenia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, four days after <gasps> this oh uh, event where you texted your honor. Yeah, it's in. Okay, good. Four days after that, you oh my God. Oh my God. tweeted <laughs> something pretty nasty about Elon Musk, didn't you? Oh, I did. Okay, thank you. So you don't like Elon Musk, right? Objection well, relevance. Yeah, who oh, gives a fuck? I, I don't know Elon Musk. Overruled. Thank you. So that was uh, the context of that is that he had... I didn't ask you for the context. I apologize. Okay. Um, but you texted something... He's so great. ...that had swear words in it. Would you agree about Elon Musk? Yes. What did he call Elon Musk? A fucking now, capitalist? let's talk about your... What did he call him? Uh, recollections here. Well, redirect is going to be amazing. 45 minutes to an hour. Your recollection is that Mr. Depp actually drove there? Yes. What type of car was he driving? An, old, an one. old one that was a convertible. An old convertible? I'm not a car guy, so I couldn't <laughs> okay. express the model. All right. I'm, and I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. I, Justine. May of I'm dying. I can't breathe. Like, I'm yes. dying. Okay. Do you recall it's good to see you, lady. Late May. Okay. Twitter has entered the chat. Now, you said that you spent a total of 45 minutes to an hour with Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd. Is that I'm correct? I'm fucking dying. After the, mostly Mr. Depp. But that's after the tour and after they were checked in throughout the course of the night. Okay. And you don't recall any of the people that were there other than Ms. Hurd's sister 
and the security guard, correct? I don't recall any of their names. Do you remember how many of them were female? We'll have to bring female? it up. I believe it was predominantly female. Do you remember how many males were there? I don't, outside of the security guard. Do you remember what any of the other people looked like? Um, they honestly just seemed like youngish hitsters, like, for <laughs> lack of a better term. I know that previously a couple of them had stayed at Hicksville Trailer Palace. That's how they knew about the place. Okay. This is the so acceptable combination with popcorn. This is my favorite milk duds and popcorn. It is my favorite combo. Thing, correct. I did not witness that. And you, do you recall the use of drugs at all? I did not witness that. Okay. Were you sitting at any point with these people at the campfire? I was not. He was working alone. Um, And when you said that that you saw Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd was yelling at Mr. Depp, where were they? They, She pulled him uh, for a chat and it was (laughs) off. Um, there. towards their trailer, like a little bit off towards the dirt. How many feet were there between the campfire and their trailer? The campfire and their trailer? Yes. Approximately 75. Okay. So where in that 75 feet did That's Ms. So Hurd pull Mr. Depp Sarcasm. and uh, yell at him and he cowered? 20. Okay. 20 from, from the campfire. From the, the campfire. Yeah. So your testimony is that Ms. Hurd Grabbed Mr. Hurt, pulled him 20 feet over, yelled at him, and he cowered. Yes, that's that's what I witnessed. And then did they go back? I, I can't make up trial. House. So you don't know whether they returned to the campfire or they returned to their trailer? You can not make not. up trial. Okay. Um, and do you know whether a- there were any uh, disagreements or physical communications, anything of that nature at the campfire? I do not. Do you know whether Mr. Depp did anything to anybody else at the campfire? I didn't see anything. Okay. Do you know whether Mr. Depp grabbed anybody's wrist and told them, asked them if they knew how many pounds of pressure it took to break their wrist? I wasn't there the whole time. Okay. Do it's you, like I saw what I saw. Your testimony that Mr. Depp and Ms. Heard. Oh, Elaine, you get what you get and you don't get upset, girl. He saw what he saw and that's all he saw. Before them? They all, the rest of the people, mm-hmm. I think about half of them had already gone to bed and they went, um, they went, I can't, it was all around the same time at the end of the night that the rest kind of scattered. There might have been a couple of people oh, that went Lane. right after them or right before, but it was all around the same time. Okay. So, so your recollection is that when Amber and Johnny Depp went back to their trailer, that dissipated. Every, everybody then left at that point. Yes. Okay. Now, uh, how far away was your house that you were staying uh, in from the trailer that Amber and Johnny Depp were staying in? I'd say it was about 75 feet away. Okay. Um, and the next time that you saw or heard anything <laughs> was when you went there in the morning and saw the broken scars. Is that yes, correct? I didn't Super hear anything true. after went to bed. Okay. And that's the extent of your knowledge? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. All right, redirect. This is what is happening. Mr. Knight, how did you get involved in this trial? Yep, yep. <laughs> um, I got a text from one of our old employees who I didn't talk Objection to. Objection hearsay? No. Don't say the context of the text. He got a text. Don't tell us what the text said. Just how did okay. you get involved? I got a, I got a text okay. from. I, I got a. That's still hearsay, Your Honor. Okay. Objection. It's yeah. not. Overruled. Thank you. Go on, Mr. Knight. I was asked. No, uh, Twitter is now part of the Objection hearsay? <laughs> Apologize. Um, uh, what did you? I got a text. You, you received a text. Okay. Yes. From and whom? From a former employee. Okay. And how long had it been since you had heard from this former employee? Approximately five years. Okay. And did you contact Mr. Depp or any of his attorneys? Objection leading? Overruled. I did not. How did you get in touch with Mr. Depp's attorneys? They got in touch with me. I objection hearsay. Oh, oh, oh. Go on, Mr. Knight. Uh, they <laughs> they reached out to me. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. I, I could, don't have an objection right now. I, I can do that too, Elaine. We got it. You're you're on edge, girl. Next question. Calm down. And how do you feel about participating in this trial? She's very relevance. 
You asked, Elaine. It's extremely relevant considering that they have accused him of being. Yeah. Thank you. How do I feel about it? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to tell the tell truth. what I saw, and that's the extent of it. I really don't care <laughs> outside of that. Thank you very much, Mr. Knight. Nothing All further. right. I assume this witness is not subject to recall. Is that correct? All right. So you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Wow. Apologies, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Okay. Thank you for calling Dr. Shaw. Okay. Dr. Shaw. A lot of live witnesses. This afternoon, man. I can't wait to take a look at the uh, at so, the social medias after this. I don't know this attorney's name. Nice to see a new face. That was wild. That was wild. And they're going to go tell their witness he can go when his flight is. Wow. 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 I think we get Dr. Curry tomorrow. Thank yeah, you. of course, Camille forgot her mic after that. What a whirlwind. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Can you please state your name for the record? Uh, my name is Richard John Shaw. Oh, do you know what the Goldwater Rule Dr. is? Shaw, what is your current position? Um, I'm a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford. I also uh, run what's called the um, Psychiatry Consult Service at the Children's Hospital at Stanford. What, if any, professional certifications have you received? Um, I have um, what's called board certification in adults and general psychiatry. Um, I obtained that from the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology in 1991. Um, and then I obtained subspecialty board certification in child and adolescent psychiatry in 1993. Are you a member of any professional organizations in the field wow. of psychiatry? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the uh, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I'm also a member of the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. How long have you been practicing psychiatry? Um, if you include my um, training in psychiatry residency in the U.S., that would be since 1985. Is that approximately 35 years? Yeah, I think so. You're asking him to math? Um, what percentage of your practice involves treating patients? This is um, yeah, approximately three quarters of my time this is working is be with a patients. Lot different um, I, I work in the pediatric Dr. hospital, treating Beagle. a combination of um, mainly children and adolescents. We're with, all excited. Um, severe medical conditions. Have you published articles or books Thank you, in your area of expertise? Hi, dear wife. Yes, I have. I've, I've published um, approximately 70 or more, more probably closer to 80 peer-reviewed manuscripts in different scientific journals. Um, I've also published a number of book chapters on, on various topics, um, approximately 30. And I have um, published three textbooks, um, one of which has gone into a second edition on topics that are related to my area of expertise. Textbooks, and he's published textbooks. One of them actually is, a, is about the treatment of PTSD in parents of uh, premature infants. Have you published um, a book through the APA? Um, actually, You're all of those books with the rules um, were published through the, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association. They have a, a publishing house, and that's been my um, publishing uh, company. What is the APA? Um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, not to be confused with the American Psychological Association, is um, a professional organization that represents psychiatrists in the U.S., um, the last time I, I looked at this, I think there's about 37 or 38,000 members. And the, the, the APA has many different roles. Um, one of it is advocacy um, in psychiatry in, in the U.S., but it also has an important role in terms of education. So they, they host an annual scientific meeting every year in which psychiatrists will present their research. Um, it publishes a number of journals in the field. And um, from time, well, fairly frequently, it publishes um, guidelines for pro for professional practice or about ethical guidelines that they um, hope that members will follow as part of their practice. Have you testified as an expert in the field of psychiatry before? Yes, I have. On how many occasions? Um, I would estimate. Um, in terms of de deposition and trial testimony, approximately 50 times in the past 
15, 20 years. What work were you asked to do in this case? Um, my role in this case was to give my opinions about the testimony and opinions from, of Dr. Spiegel, whom you heard oh from yesterday morning. And what work have you done to form your opinion? I, um, I was present yesterday in court listening to his testimony. Um, I have viewed his um, depositions. He had two depositions earlier this year. Oh, boy. And I, um, I watched those depositions. I've also read a lot of deposition testimony. Um, for example, testimony by Mr. Depp's psychiatrist, Dr. Blaustein, uh, by his physician, Dr. Kipper, and nurse, Debbie Lloyd. I've reviewed depositions by... Many the of two the, experts um, couldn't be more different. Therapists involved in this couldn't case, be more including um, Dr. Banks, the relationship consultant, um, Dr. Um, Cohen, who was Ms. Hurd's um, therapist, well, and I think Dr. Anderson, who I think provided some couples therapy. Uh, I've also reviewed. Um, the medical records of Dr. Kipper and Dr. Blastein and some various email communications. Um, I think a lot of the information that has been talked about here. Thank you. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to offer Dr. Shaw as an expert in the field of psychiatry. <clears throat> I Any think objection? that's going to fly. Can we approach? Okay. Can we approach? <laughs> oh, Ms. Callanan. This is a new character from the last episode, Making Another Appearance. Your Honor, at this time, we would like to offer Dr. Shaw as an expert. So I guess we're going to get to see her with this expert here. We'll, so we'll know what she looks like. Um, any objection? Mr. Danehoff, can we approach? So this is like, I suppose, like a voir dire situation we have here. Court, okay. Sidebar, Mr. Danehoff. As I understand it from the disclosures, he will testify to the... Oh, oh dear. Oh, dear. To the Goldwater rule. Oh, dear. The court, okay. Mr. Danehoff, so to the extent it's limited to that, it sounded like he's going to go... I know we're talking about voir dire, but I just wanted to make sure that you would rule in the motion in limine, one, that he couldn't talk about Dr. Blostein's record, so as long as it's limited to the Goldwater rule, I have two objections. I guess that should be TWO. I'll just go ahead and interject here. So, as Dr. Blostein came up before, in, again, yes, or last time's episode, um, in regards to, I don't remember which expert it was, but this came up. This, 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 from what I can surmise, the problem with this is these records were all handwritten and they were completely uh, illegible. And in fact, um, Emily comments during the sidebar that they're all laughing and Judge A is like laughing, especially. And she's like, what are they laughing about? You know, um, and they're laughing, looking at this, you know, she doesn't know what they're looking at. But they're looking at something. And it sounded like from when I read the sidebar, they're laughing because the handwriting is just, you know, there's the jokes about doctor's handwriting. It sounds like this is just no one can make heads or tails of it. So I think that's what this, this is another instance of that. Like, they just can't use that, um, those records. So anyway, okay. Um, so couldn't talk about Dr. Blostein's records. So as long as it's limited to the Goldwater rule, well, Goldwater rule, I have to, obje oh, right, TWO, I'm assuming. Ms. Kellen, the disclosure is not just about the Goldwater rule. He also talks about different other professional organizations that have guidelines, the court. As long as we're staying on ethical issues, that's what he's going to testify to, not the contents of Ms. Conan, Dr. Blostein's records. Yes, correct, yes. He's not talking about that, the court. He's just talking about ethicals, Ms. Conan, yes. Yes, well, some of it is, uh, and some of it going to be about, based on what Dr. Spiegel did, is in violate, violence of that. I'm sure that should have been violation, not violence, the court. But he's still just talking about ethical rules, Ms. Conan, correct. Mr. Nadelhoff, so if it is limited, yeah, with that limitation, no objection. The court, yeah, Goldwater and other ethical rules. Mr. Nadelhoff, and ethical rules, yeah, the court. As long as it's not substantive to other medical records. Mr. Nadelhoff, yeah. Back to the court. Um, I don't know what they're talking about up at the bench. They should be able to see the live feed. See, you see Depp's team over here. They're always turning around to look at what's going on at the bench. They have a live feed of the court reporter. I've not seen her seen Herd's team um, doing the same thing. I don't know if they have a live feed. I don't know if, I mean, they're, it, theirs is on an iPad. And so when they're up at the bench, the court reporter is still taking notes and we get, you know, them Taught, seeing right. what's going on, so but we're not objection? getting that. Uh, no objection. Your Honor. Right, we're so not getting still, that on her team. I don't know if they just don't have one. If they don't want one, I don't know. 
Dr. Shaw, um, you testified that you observed Dr. Spiegel's testimony yesterday? Yes, that's correct. And to reorient the jury, can you please generally describe the main areas in which Dr. Spiegel testified? Uh, yes. He, uh, objection, Your Honor. They heard what he testified to. What's his opinion? All right. about? Foundation to reorient them. That, that's okay. Well, we can move forward. Okay. Do you have an opinion of Dr. Spiegel's testimony? Yes, I do. And what is your opinion? I, I have a couple of primary opinions. Um, the first is, is, is that I, my opinion is that he violated the ethical principles that are outlined in the Goldwater Rule. Yep. When he gave his opinions about um, Mr. Depp, specifically with relationship to personality so it came traits up first. and his cognitive abilities. Goldwater came up first. Um, my second primary opinion would be that um, the re that the Dr. Spiegel's opinions um, were unreliable and that he had insufficient objection, information. Your objection, Your Honor. All right. It's like his Peter opinion, yes. Needlehoff. It's his opinion. Sidebar. Mr. Needlehoff, she just said, just said it was going to be about the ethics rules, and now he's going on about reliability of opinion, Ms. Cohen. So the motion in limine was specific. I mean, I was just going to say this. Is I know it's specific about Dr. Bosty. Um, specific to excluding his testimony about the quality of Dr. Blaustein's records. His disclosure ex includes all the other things that Dr. Spiegel relied on to form his opinion, including the videotape deposition of Mr. Depp, to form his opinions about his cognitive functions, right? He reviewed that, and in order for him to be able to testify how he violated the Goldwater Rule, he has to get into what records he looked at. He's not going to get into it substantively about the motion to eliminate, and I have in front of right here, Your Honor, Mr. Nienhoft. He's talking about how his opinions are not reliable. He wants to say that he violated the Goldwater rule or other ethical rules. By doing this or that, that's allowable. But to say whether his opinion is reliable or not, that's a, differ, that's a different thing. Or I think that's a different thing, Ms. Kellen. So the motion in limine was specific to, and I have it here, Your Honor, Mr. Nienhoff, but disclosure is all you're going to talk about, Ms. Kellen. No, that's not true. The court, let's just wait. Are you saying he's going to rebut Dr. Spiegel's opinions? Ms. Kellen, say that again? The court, does he say he's going to rebut Dr. Spiegel's opinions? Ms. Callan, yes, does. Mr. Neohoff, no, he just says, Ms. Callan, yes, Mr. Neohoff, his opinions are just that it doesn't meet the Goldwater rule. Ms. Callan, Dr. Shaw will testify concerning Dr. Spiegel's opinions. I don't think any of that's necessary at all. Not, I mean, you know, Mr. Neohoff, but that's summary, Ms. Callan. And then we get into specifics, and he was designated as a rebuttal to Dr. Spiegel. And sorry, Your Honor, okay, we have here, Dr. Spiegel failed to abide by the Goldwater rule. The court, right, Ms. Callan, and then the court, I got that, Ms. Callan, I'm sorry. The opinions that Dr. Spiegel intends to offer based on the incomplete data set, lacking in the mental status examination and lacking review of prior psychiatric history, Mr. Neuhoff, and then he continues to talk about Goldwater. It's all about the Goldwater rule, so it's not about his reliability. No, whether he's following the Goldwater rule or not, Ms. Cowan, that's part of it. The court's still under the Goldwater. Ms. Cowan, say that again. The court's still under the Goldwater, so you can have, so you have to stay with that, Ms. Cowan. He also talks about neuropsychological testing. This was part of his disclosure, and he was going to testify about that. The court, that would still, that's when he violated the Goldwater rule. Mr. Nienhoff, right, correct, the court. So he can testify to that. Mr. Nienhoff, right, about all about how he violated the rule, whether or not he violated the Goldwater rule, but not about the relia. I mean, there's, I think there's a difference. He's all about the ethics and not about the reliability. The court, he can give his first opinion he talked about and any supporting documents in supporting testimony to that, but when it goes into doesn't seem like there's anything here about his opinions as far as reliability or miscounting. So to the Goldwater rule, so the Goldwater rule talks about how you have to rely on certain information, the court, right? Miscounting. So in a way, he's going to be talking about that. So is it just the issue? The court, yes, exactly. His opinion all has to be within the Goldwater rule, miscounting. So I think the issue is that he said reliable, Mr. Nadelhoff. He was talking about the reliability of Dr. Spiegel's opinion. He can talk about whatever he wants to say, how he violated the rule. Court, this is how he violated it. And then some of the information is going to come. Ms. Callan, okay. The court makes sense. Ms. Callan, it does. The court, okay. Ms. Reinoff, okay. Back to him, court. Lynn, I totally crack up at how you say Elaine's name. Elaine. Is it possible Johnny Depp or Amber Heard could testify again? It's always possible that Depp can. I can't imagine they would call Heard again. I can't imagine there's anything for them to call Heard again. What, if any, boost does board certification uh, give Dr. an expert? Dr. Shaw, you mentioned the Goldwater rule. What it depends on how much weight the, the jury gives rule. it. Um, the Goldwater rule um, came about um, 
Oh, ethics. In response to uh, an incident that, that occurred during the 1964 presidential oh, wow. election when Senator Barry Goldwater wow. was running as a Republican candidate. And there was a magazine called Fact Magazine that started a campaign to discredit Senator Goldwater. And they obtained a mailing list from the AMA and sent out a single survey uh, questionnaire to all to about 12,000 psychiatrists in the US asking if they felt that Senator Goldwater was fit to run for office. And about 2,000 psychiatrists responded, a thousand of whom expressed very negative opinions about Senator Goldwater and made comments such as, for example, he was a megalomaniac, he was a paranoid schizophrenic, that he had narcissistic personality disorder. Um, and as a result of that, um, he was replaced as a candidate um, and then went on to sue Fact Magazine for defamation of character. And he was successful. I in love the lawsuit. history because I didn't um, know any of this. And in response to this incident, um, the American Psychiatric Association that I think was really concerned about how psychiatry was being represented and statements psychiatrists were making about someone they had never met or evaluated, um, issued the Goldwater Rule. And the main premise of the Goldwater Rule was that um, it was improper for a psychiatrist to render a professional opinion about a public figure um, unless they had personally and closely evaluated them. Um, what justifications did the APA provide, other than the ones you mentioned, for enacting the Goldwater Rule? Um, they wanted to make sure that uh, psychiatric illness wasn't being stigmatized. They wanted to um, ensure that individuals weren't defamed by statements made by a psychiatrist that didn't that weren't backed up by medical evidence. And they also they wanted, wanted to preserve the stigma. integrity of the psychiatric profession, since I think the public so in general and the psychiatrists speaks out publicly and expresses an opinion, a psychiatric opinion, um, people generally like to take that seriously. And the APA wanted to make sure that those opinions were credible and could be relied upon. Have there been any updates? He's to just so pleasant. Rule? Yeah, since um, 1973, which was when the Goldwater Rule first came out, there have been um, a number of um, revisions. Have, I don't and, think we'll get to um, Kate Moss today. I'm publications by the APA. They're called Annotations in Psychiatry, in which the Goldwater Rule has been better defined and expanded in, in some to some degree. Um, so, for example, in 2017, in this um, this publication, they the APA reasserted that it was. Um, not ethical to provide a psychiatric or professional opinion about someone who had not been evaluated personally by that psychiatrist, huh. that it was um, unethical to provide an evaluation without obtaining consent from that individual. Um, they also um, sort of really kind of defined what a, prof what a professional opinion is. And, that, and how they defined it is that an opinion that a psychiatrist expresses about someone's speech, behavior, or any characteristic about that person, um, if it's that opinion is made using the expertise, experience, and knowledge inherent in the practice of psychiatry, that is considered a professional opinion. So it, it might include making a diagnosis or not making a diagnosis, and the other, I think, a couple of important things oh about my. that 2017 document were that the APA... Yep, everything, um, everything the other doctor said. If a psychiatrist is to give an opinion about someone, about the diagnosis or Happy graduation. personality characteristics, whatever, that they have to follow an appropriate methodology. They have to 
do an evaluation that follows the standard practice of a psychiatrist here in the U.S. Oh, my heart goes out to um, Lillian. And if they don't do that, they are considered to be, um, uh, you know, affecting the integrity of the, both the psychiatrist and the psychiatric profession. And, and this revision of the Goldwater um, rule definitely received a lot of support. The president of the APA at the time stated that breaking the Goldwater rule was um, irresponsible, um, stigmatizing, and, and definitely unethical. So that was a statement, very strong statement from the president of the APA. unethical. Are there exceptions to the Goldwater Rule? There are exceptions, yeah. And I think Dr. Spiegel um, had a lot to say about this yesterday when he was saying that if you couldn't express an opinion without evaluating someone, it sort of made the whole specialty of or role of experts in the court sort of null and void. Yeah, which I thought was stupid. But there are exceptions and situations in which it doesn't make an expert know. can give testimony in court. They just can't diagnose. So one good example would be if there was a medical malpractice case or if there was a case about that involved a patient who'd committed suicide and the courts wanted to find out whether the psychiatrist had followed appropriate practice, the expert can review medical records Interesting. and can give an opinion, provided those records um, have sufficient information, for example, about the diagnoses, about the treatment, about how the patient was responding or not responding to treatment. Did you form an opinion about whether Dr. Spiegel complied with the Goldwater Rule? I'll talk about this uh, in a break. Well, my opinion is that he did not. He expressed a number of professional he did. opinions about Mr. Depp um, that we heard about yesterday. Um, and again, he did so without um, an evaluation, without consent. Um, he did not follow the guidelines of the APA in the 2017 revision, where it was considered important that um, there be sufficient information obtained by that expert to give an opinion. Um, so I, I, I would definitely felt that they were, his, his conduct, unfortunately, did violate the Goldwater rule. And specifically, what goal. opinions of um, They're gonna the let doctor's the jury yesterday decide. did you do you feel violated the Goldwater rule? They're going to let the jury decide it was unethical. He's going to yeah, say I it violated the, the rule. So the two the primary the ones, the, um, the first that you heard about was that Dr. Spiegel had professional opinions about Mr. Depp's personality. And he talked a lot about how he believed that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. So, um, and, and he also, you know, talked a lot about narcissistic personality disorder. So narcissistic personality disorder is a diagnosis in um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's called the DSM-5 for short. It's a diagnostic manual published by the APA. Objection, Your Honor. Okay. Huh. They're approaching for a sidebar. Mr. Neilhoff, I think now he's passed the Goldwater rule. I think he's now talking about, he's criticizing Dr. Spiegel's opinions beyond the Goldwater rule. Imagine that, right? The court. I think, do you want to respond, Ms. Kellen? I'm sorry. Again, this is going to how Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule and he includes it in his disclosure. The court, this one, Ms. Kellen, sorry. The court, I did see how that he violated misconduct giving an opinion about the court. I did read that in one of the sub paragraphs, Mr. Neilhoff. Okay. The court. I'm going to try to take a break now at four. They got a break. We didn't. I'm going to try to give them a break at four just to let you know, Ms. Cownan. I'm on 45 of 46, the court. Okay. Ms. Cownan, thank you. Back to open court we go. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> All right. So we are going to be getting into more of his testimony. I don't know what they're approaching over. He's talking about the DSM. He he is just like, okay, well, this was the opinion um, that he was rendering. I'd be, I really, really want to know if they're going to bring up um, the narcissistic personality traits of eating candy. At I have my candies in my control of your self cup today, but I really want to know if that's going to come up, because that would be interesting. Sure. So I was, I was just talking about narcissistic personality disorder in the DSM-5. So the diagnostic criteria for that are 
Um, I'm not going to remember every word about this, but essentially it's a, a pattern of grandiosity. Oh, um, I agree with the you. The need for admiration. Candy. Um, a, a lack of empathy. Uh oh, he's diagnosing YouTubers. By that person since young adulthood. I'm teasing. And the I'm DSM being five has nine specific criteria. The need for attention. And for someone to meet the diagnosis, you have to meet five of those criteria. And so when, as a psychiatrist, we're trying to make a diagnosis of any personality disorder or any diagnosis in general, um, the normal um, professional guidelines would dictate that we would do a very careful diagnostic interview. And there are actually interviews specifically written to assess personality disorders. Um, it's also possible to have um, the individual fill out questionnaires. There's something called narcissistic personality inventory. This is a 40 item checklist that a um, checklist. taps into various components of narcissistic personality disorder. And it's also possible to get psychological testing um, like the MMPI that I think you heard about in reference to um, one of the other experts here. Yeah, we so did with hear all about of the this MMPI. information, We've got um, a whole education information on cluster from, B personality um, disorders. Family members, co work colleagues, um, information of that sort. It is possible to come up with a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. So in the case of Dr. Spiegel, what the fuck he was that even? Had none of this information, even though he came out and stated with what he described as a degree of medical certainty that Mr. Depp had narcissistic personality traits. And if I you really remember, he brings up the ADHD. Somewhat towards the end of his um, testimony yesterday, he was asked to, um, since he couldn't provide any um, documentation from the medical record about narcissistic personality disorder or narcissistic personality traits, he was asked about what um, is referred to a lot in this in his testimony is record evidence. So information that he obtained from depositions, Records. from text messages, from emails, what, what, whatever. And um, so he was asked to give, I think, um, five examples of record evidence that would make it seem like Mr. Depp met criteria for narcissistic personality traits. And I'll just mention a couple of them, just 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 to illustrate my opinion. Yes, I want that, him as multiverse testimony was multiverse not vision. really hold together. So he stated, for example, that um, one of the criteria for narcissism is um, narcissistic personality disorder is a sense of entitlement. And the example Dr. Spiegel gave is that he believed that Miss Heard married him for his money. So clearly sense of entitlement is a, from a psychiatry perspective, that's very different from a belief that someone wanted you for your for money. Your money. Um, Though the entitlement the could have been example, the demanding $20 million um, from the former agent, but he didn't that say that. He was asked to give an example of how Mr. Depp had shown that he was envious of others, which is another criterion for narcissistic personality disorder. And the example that Dr. Spiegel gave is that Mr. Depp was jealous of Miss Hurd. Nope, the jury is protected. Because he believed she was they having will not an affair be on with Mr. Franco. Ever. Um, now, if we look at these two terms as a psychiatrist, there's a big difference be between being envious and being jealous. As and a psychiatrist, jealous. when I think about envy, I think about um, somebody wants something that someone else has, and it makes them jealous. I think this is going beyond his education. Right. No? He, he's giving his opinion as to how... Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule with respect to his testimony about narcissistic personality traits. Yeah, he, he did, but now it's the same objection. Next question. Okay. Um, okay, and you mentioned two major examples. Um, what was the second one? <laughs> the second one Here's was just another question. being envious from with being jealous. Oh, oh sorry, um, Dr. Shaw. I mean, um, you mentioned two major examples of ways uh, Dr. Spiegel violated the Goldwater rule. What, what is the this next second? Way? Oh, sure. Um, I, so I was with him on that category had to do with um, Dr. Spiegel's evaluation of Mr. Depp's cognitive abilities. And 
he, his general opinion was that Mr. Depp had um, deficits in his memory, in his attention, in his processing speed, in his, he, that he had word finding difficulties. Um, again, Dr. Spiegel did not evaluate Mr. Right. Depp and the information that he relied upon, um, there were two, two pieces of information. The first was that he watched a very long deposition that Mr. Depp gave um, the day after I think he had flown back from London uh, to the East Coast. And um, he made observations and about Mr. Depp's behavior in, that, all tired, in that deposition. It's last week of trial um, vibes. And felt that he could opine or give an opinion about processing speed and other, other cognitive aspects. Um, Dr. Shaw, yesterday, Dr. Spiegel was talking about correlation and causation. What is the difference between correlation and causation? Objections. It's not in this designation. It is. We can approach and I can show you. <laughs> Boom. On the first day of trial, the judge said to me, a sidebar and a pear tree. Um, we're doing it. Sidebar, miscount him. It's on page 49 where he talks about the risk factors and Mr. Nadelhoff, where, what is it? I'm sorry, the court, page 49, Ms. Conan talks about the risk factors right here. Mr. Nadelhoff, I don't see correlation. The court, I'll overrule the objection. Ms. Conan, okay, thank you. Back to open court. <sighs> man, oh man, oh man. Um, go ahead, Dr. Shaw. Yes, yeah, so the, the difference between there might be, I'll take a look at that. And I'll take a look at that when we... Um, Correlation um, is a statistical When we break, I'll take a look at that for sure. ...of a relationship between two different factors. So in Dr. Spiegel's testimony, he talked about, you know, there being a correlation between uh, opinions That's he had a about bummer. Mr. If there's Depp, two Dr. Spiegel's. His narcissistic personality traits, his substance abuse, things of that nature. Um, <laughs> so a correlation doesn't say anything about whether or not these factors caused that you know, the, the behavior he was, was discussing. Okay. Um, now it's probably a good time for a break. If okay, sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I know you had a break, but we didn't. So we're going to go ahead and take our afternoon break for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? You can stay right there, doctor. Oh, this couldn't be a more stark contrast to Dr. Spiegel's testimony. Right. You're, you're excused for the 15 minutes too, sir, doctor. Okay, we'll come back at 4.17 then. Finish the day? Okay. Come back at 4.17 to finish the day. The day. Cross-examination. Oh, that was quicker than I thought. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Uh, you're not offering any opinion as to Mr. Depp's psychology, correct? That's correct. And No, they're just offering an opinion as to you, your psychiatrist. I've talked a lot about the Goldwater rule. Um, you... No, no case where an expert has been excluded from testifying based on the Goldwater rule, correct? Huh? I don't know about the whole universe of cases. It's possible, but I don't know personally about one. And and you before this case, you've never offered an opinion on the Goldwater rule before, correct? That's correct. Because people normally and follow it, Needlehawk. On the Goldwater rule, correct? I have not. And you've never given a presentation on the Goldwater rule, correct? I have not. It's well known. And you've never been on any committees regarding the Goldwater rule, correct? I have not. All right. Redirect. It's interesting to see them all working together. Dr. Shaw, um, Mr. Nadelhoff just asked you about the court authorization of uh, Mr. Depp's evaluation. Are you aware that the court has twice denied Ms. Hurd's request for an evaluation of Mr. Depp? I heard that yesterday in, in testimony, yes. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. All Thank right. You, sir. Next you witness. Either have a seat or, or you can leave. Thank you. So yeah. done. Again, do not do any outside research. Do not discuss the case with anybody. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. They've okay? been moving Thank you. very, very quickly. And I think there's just a couple of things I need from you. Like tomorrow, let me, uh, by the end of the of the day tomorrow, if I could get clean jury instructions uh, without the sights on them for the ones that have been admitted, uh, and also the verdict forms as well. Oh, uh, verdict forms worked out. Okay. 
Your Honor, we've, we sent revised jury instructions um, to them yesterday morning and a revised verdict form today. So just waiting to get okay, back to sure. coordinate. All sure. Right. Thank you. Get it done. Um, and you're working with Jamie about some exhibits. There's some that were both sides noted that were in, in uh, evidence that are not. So I want to make sure everybody gets everything cleared up. You're caught up? Uh, okay, sort good. out All right, your exhibits. That going so we get that, make sure that's taken care of. Um, as far as time well, left, well, Sammy, today, time. I can give you a rough estimate for two reasons. One, you had some depositions, so make sure you give the, the breakdowns to Sammy about those. And two, Sammy wasn't here today. He had a mandatory CLE that he had to do. So I just did a rough estimate, and I want to qualify that as a rough estimate. Um, but it looks like uh, the plaintiff has used about five hours today, and the defendant used about an hour and 15 minutes. That's what I have. Okay? And again, that's a rough estimate, so don't expect expect them to be the same, but Sammy's going to get to it this evening and send you uh, an email this evening with the actual accurate times. Okay. Anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Have a good evening. We'll see you in the morning. Judge A, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.